it's in favor of religion. It's very minor, but they are there. Okay. Oh, we're on air. Yes. Uh, um, maybe we shouldn't have been dust sitting in, or well, we weren't really dust sitting. Maybe we shouldn't have been talking so they get half a, a conversation when we start out. Oh, it's wow. okay. We're starting right now. Yeah, Schopenhauer's right. hours on religion. Yeah. Dialogue. Yeah. All right. I kind of like I said. I when I when we started this one, I, I kind of like this one because it's it's weird. It's almost like a conversation that could have easily happened yesterday. Mm. <laughs> like uh, after the new atheism and everything. I mean, this is like 150 years before the quote unquote new atheism, and almost every single argument is in here already. Yes. Well, the examples are a bit dated. Mm. Uh, well, well, I, mm. well, I definitely want to go through. I want to see what, what you think. I think, I don't know, just as a starting question, there's two guys in there. <coughs> They're both atheists, obviously. Yes. But, yeah. uh, wow, I'm going to really screw this up. But I'm going to imagine the first guy is... Demophiles. Yeah, that's and what the I second, thought. <laughs> oh yeah, the second guy is Philalethes. That's what I. I was close. Yeah, that's what I thought. Too. Okay. Hey. Demophiles and Philalethes. But I'm just gonna call him D and P. <laughs> that's my uh, name. <laughs> yes, this, you're in there already. Uh, so, um, I guess you you could be you could kind of find yourself more in line with either one of these guys. Even being an atheist, right? Who did you find yourself kind of more in line with? Although they both delivered wonder, wonderful like arguments against each other, it was very entertaining to watch the back and forth or read the back and forth. I can I don't know. Just straight up, I found myself more and more agreeing with Mr. P. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm. I guess I'm the representative of. Of these people who are sympathetic for religion here, here, I really, though he gets, it's slaughtered in the end, and I was I was down for Mr. D here. I I want to say that I was for Mr. P, but um, I I don't know. I mean, I I just want to ask you. I just want to ask, how, how much was Mr. D really for? Religion. I mean, if he is for it, you could you could say that it was a very kind of condescending, yes, approval of religion. Both of them were very condescending towards religion. Neither of them ever entertained the possibility that it was true, which is what makes this really interestingly modern, right? I mean, it's like Schopenhauer is taking up the 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 the, the mantle here, the taking up the uh, the argument already from the point of view that every argument about God is over. It's already been basically settled. Mm. Uh, we can't prove that there's a God. Kant has already shown that we can't talk about that. It's outside the field of rational inquiry. So now we have to talk about, is religion useful? No, I think if you consider Schopenhauer's audience, he's, you know, uh, Johnny Bible Thumb <laughs> is not going to be reading Schopenhauer. Yeah. He's not going to be reading this essay. Yeah. So, <laughs> This essay is for Richard Dawkins. <laughs> yeah. This is who he's writing this essay for. <laughs> and Richard Dawkins, you know, these new atheist people tend to have a very much more scathing opinion than ever. And so I think probably the Mr. D here, here is the only way he's going to get into this conversation is with this. Though yeah. I think he could have been there was a lot of benefits of religion he didn't touch on. Mm. Um, I think he could have been a little bit sh more stronger there on his, you know, selling his line there, there rather than. It's actually really kind of interesting if you watch the how the conversation is guided, because there's sometimes when Mr. P actually sets traps. He lures examples out of Mr. D. Mm. It's very clever writing on Schopenhauer's part. Mm. But, but if you know, assuming these people were were actually in a debate and not just more or less trying to prove Schopenhauer's point. <laughs> would, Basically, yes. I would have liked Mr. D not to be so easily lured about, you know, like a, 
by, you know, like a donkey with a carrot in front of his face. <laughs> it seems like in some, some parts. But he did win one at least one argument in there. I mean, he did, he did carry the day. But he carried the day on the most condescending opinion, right? It, because it's interesting, Demophilus here, or whatever it is, has no faith in mankind. Yeah. He, Demophilus has basically said yeah. thinks that mankind is a worthless lot that has basically the intellectual power of an ant. And it's interesting, the, the atheist, the, the real powerful atheist here, the, Mr. P, he, he still believes that mankind can still somehow live in a godless world. Yeah, the truth at all costs. I think that's how he starts it, right? Um, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's really strange kind of foreshadowing in the beginning where he says, uh, Demophilus, he says, you're like, then I suppose the device of doctors would be, you know, may pills be made and the world perish over them. Like, he sees himself more as a doctor of people than as, as, as a truth speaker. Right, he wants to fix the people. He doesn't care. I mean, he's given up on their ability to know or understand the truth. He just wants them to do the right thing. Mm. Truth, yeah. truth is out of the picture. And that was that was his whole the whole basis of his entire argument is people are you know, people are stupid. You can't expect them any better of them. <laughs> They're not going to be reading Schopenhauer <laughs> or those masses. Because even Plato <laughs> said so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. Play to the, the crowd cannot be philosophically enlightened. I like to repeat. Yeah. That. So yeah. I don't know. What did you think about that point? I kind of, as much as I'm on Mr. P's side, I don't know. I found that point very, I don't know, very attractive. Um, I, I, like, I think that's where he carried the day, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. I I don't know. I I couldn't. I don't know what I'd say against that. I mean, yeah, right. I mean, even if I told them the quote unquote truth straight up, what whatever that is. Mm. Uh, they wouldn't have the ability to grasp that truth. Like, I mean, I could tell you, you know, like, in in 2001, a guy went in space and became a space baby, right? But, I mean, that that's not – that's just you accepting that by sheer force – my force on you, right? I mean, it's not – you didn't discover any of the meaning in the movie or anything yourself. You would just end up, again, isn't, believing it on faith. Isn't that what – that was one of the points he made, right? This, yeah. That was one of his best points was that even if you explain the truth – it would still have been accepted only on authority because they still weren't thinking it out for themselves. Mm. Right. So it doesn't matter. Even if they had religion or they just had, I don't know, a philosophy book, both of them would just be accepted on the authority of the person giving the argument, mm. which, I don't know, it seems true. <laughs> well, you know, even as, as smart as you two, two are, are, not including myself in this lot, but... <laughs> but um, you know, if there was a book written by uh, Schopenhauer and a book written by myself, of uh, uh, whose opinion would you place more worth on? <laughs> um, <clears throat> so obviously, the one with the better arguments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> I mean, I suppose if I was going to decide which order I'd read the books in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm a one book first, another book second. And well, you did. I do remember you guys passing up on one of the greatest new philosophers of our time. Yes, <laughs> we did pass up on him. Yes, I, I read his book and learned his knowledge. Oh God! <laughs> are you sure? Are you sure in that case something wasn't taken away from you? <laughs> <laughs> but I think he took more than he gave. Though I, I really. You know, like the idea of looking at religion and as kind of a, like, this is going to sound incredibly condescending, but, you know, philosophy for dummies. You know, the yellow book of philosophy here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, which is, you know, probably you, Mr. D here would, would agree with that, that yeah. analogy. Do you, because, you know, he's calling people stupid, but, but the fact that it is, you know, it is a form of philosophy. It does have the same values as philosophy. Which <coughs> even Mr. D, he agrees with here. Mm. And he says, yeah, if it wasn't for the fact that it has to be believed on, on faith and you know, lock people into to it. That's what he saw, you know, that's it, the start of this argument. And they keep, it seems like it goes in circles for a good long 
on time for the early pages is mm-hmm. is based on that philosophy uh, religion is philosophy of the masses says says but religion is bad because does uh, it grasps people in, at an impressionable age impressionable age if I can talk right and later prevents them from further studies into the truth. Mm. Yeah, I mean I mean if I were to if I were to advance Mr Mr Phililides, Mr P here, his argument even more, maybe I would have said um your your idea is a self fulfilling prophecy. You think that mankind can never live with in a godless world or he couldn't live in a godless world because he's not smart enough to understand it, but you 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 smash out his earliest way, his earliest re- budding reason with your religion. So you are fulfilling your own prophecy by saying that people couldn't live without religion. Mm. If I if 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 I wanted to advance it a little bit further. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh boy, I like that. I kind of I like that. I, that point about like the people in general just being too busy lifting yes. things and carrying things and um, I like that too. I don't know, having kids and cheating on their wives and stuff like this, like whatever you want to say. I, I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't in there, but I just threw that in there. Okay. Uh, like, <laughs> Is there someone here? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, it's just, uh, I, I, I imagine that be one of the things people would busy, be busy doing. <laughs> it, seems, it seems like, uh, um, it, I don't know where to go with that point. Like, Religion, but the point is made over and over again. The re- religious truth is a truth based solely on authority, right? I mean, it's just top down. This is the way it is. Don't you question it? Uh, but Mister Mister P here, he loves his like truth at any cost thing. Like, no, no, there, there are no, no untruths are to be allowed in any sphere at any time. Mm. Uh, did you think like as I was reading this? Tell me if you thought this was crazy. Uh, I think Schopenhauer kind of looked at it this way. Um, P is the world is representation, and D is the world is will. Um, huh? D um, uh, looks at the inner significance of religion, because he's the will. And P looks at the outer, from the outside, it looks at the truth of propositions. Um and how it takes shape in the world, right? So P is looking at the shape it takes, and D is looking <laughs> at the inner core, right? It, it, Schopenhauer's whole theory of the will and representation. Uh, D is on the inside, P is on the outside, D is practical, P is theoretical, D talks about morality, P thinks about metaphysics. Like, these are the oppositions between these two guys. And in the end, doesn't it boil down to, like, uh, practicality versus... Truth, like why have the truth? Why not be practical? Mm. A, a lot mm. of this boils down to that. Like, why the truth? Why even bother the, having the truth? What would be the point of it? Like, I think D's whole thing was like, why this? The truth isn't worth it. As long as we can get people to do what they should be doing, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I think D has no respect for the truth, or at least he's, he's happy with he's happy with being the dark knight. Yeah, um, he's happy with being the lie that the people need to live, right? The, the hero that they need, the hero that they, I don't know, not the hero that they want, but the hero they deserve, or I don't know. Uh, it is very Dark Knight kind of, of, of thing he's going with here, that the holy lie is, is, is his side. I like that idea a lot, though, about, about that one being the will and the other being representation. Mm-hmm. But doesn't doesn't eventually, uh, Felicity's Mr. P here, he kind of, he kind of, I, I, I kind of felt like he conceded the point. He argued for a while, but he kind of conceded the point that people were, this is the one point I felt he gave in on, was that he, he said, look, yeah, maybe you're right. People are too stupid to grasp the truth. It's, it yeah. felt like he, he kind of lost there. If, 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 if he lost at any point, he lost there. Mm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think that was Schopenhauer speaking out through both of them. <laughs> Well, they're too busy cracking whips. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the fools. Um, I I don't know. I what 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 if what if like P and kind of tried to continue on and said something like, 
uh, my I it's not simply that religion's morality is right, but the shape it takes is wrong. It's just I question the very morality of religion itself. I mean, that would be the only next step he could take, wouldn't it? I mean, like the, he D seems to come out and say, like, no, 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 all this is true in its core. It represents something true, right? It's an allegory for something true. Mm. Uh, if if P just came out and said no, it's an incorrect. It's even even the moral message is wrong. I think they might try to go further. I I don't know Schopenhauer. I don't think he would agree with that though. I think he thought the core of Christianity was um, to what deny the world, which he liked. So I don't. He wouldn't have gone there, but it seems mm. like the idea of truth at any any cost must be some kind of moral moral resolution, right? The truth mm. always. Never be deceived, never lie, never deceive others, never deceive yourself. Seem, there must be some kind of moral calling to this. Isn't that what Schopenhauer did in his philosophy, too? I mean, he, he basically said the world wasn't worth living in. So, obviously, that wasn't a, <clears throat> wasn't a happy statement. I, I, he, in a way, he kind of was both of these people, right? Yeah. He, he, he felt like he had to tell the people... He had to tell everybody how bad the world is, and if that made people sad, then so be it. It's better to know the truth about the world than it is to live in ignorance of it. So he's yeah. partially one of he's partially this character too. Mm. He, that that idea about the religion being true uh, as an allegory. Um, I, I, it was interesting when he started talking about how, well, there are some people that are trying to say, well, it's true of the uh, allegory. If only religion would concede that it's in an allegory, he would accept it. Mr. P would have accepted it, but they, they, can't, they can't say that. The religion just can't do that, so it has to, it has to say that it's true literally uh, for it to work. Yeah. Even though it, it's it's only true via allegory, so it has to lie. There's like an element where it's simply forced to lie to, to function. Though I didn't get um um D's response to that, at where he said this is on a three thirty four. This is three of uh, the animal metaphysicum. This thing. Um, Man is a metaphysical animal. No, no, no. Uh, uh, we talk so, uh, you know, Mysteries. when um P says exactly that, you know. Oh, uh, it would be okay as, hey, if it gave reference, if it admitted that it was just telling the truth through, you know, allegorical. Uh, and then Mr. D says, as, oh no, for this has been thought of, for this too has been thought of. Mm. If religion may not exactly acknowledge its allegorical nature, it gives sufficient indication thereof. Mm. Uh, and then he goes on, on in. I'm right here with uh, Mr. Or Pee when he says, and how does it do that? <laughs> but then he goes on like, oh, mysteries, mysteries. He's, it, it has mysteries, so it's telling you, it's not saying that it's all allegorical, but it's giving you, you the hints you should get to know it's allegorical. Oh, I, that didn't really make sense to me. Oh, I, I kind of thought he was getting after, don't you find a lot of people say something like, I'm going to give a terribly lame example here. And like, why did the earthquake happen? God wanted it to. I mean, that's, that's literally a mystery, right? Mm. I mean, that's not an answer because you don't know why God wanted it to. Mm. But God's ways are unknowable. I mean, but it's a tool to get you to move past the question. Mm. I, I guess, I, I think that's kind of the mystery he was thinking of here, no? Is that, is that, is that kind of, I don't know, I had trouble with this point too. This is the only interpretation I was able to drag out of this. Oh, could he possibly be thinking too of like a mystery is, for example, what do they call it? The, oh, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look so stupid here because I don't know the term. The transfiguration, uh, right, when you take the wafer and the wine and it's supposed to be at that moment transformed into the body and the body of blood of Christ, right? And then you symb symbolically take part in ingesting the body and the blood of a living of the, the living Christ, right? And this is that how that happens is supposed to be like a mystery, right? It just it but, but I mean obviously obviously it didn't happen, right? It's a wafer. And it's and it's 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 a drink and it but so in other words, I mean at that moment you just kind of have to accept that 
somehow this wafer and this wine represents body and blood. I mean, it's almost telling you right out that it's an allegory right there, right? Because you're not really literally eating blood or flesh. Um, isn't that kind of an example, too, of how like religion almost shows you that it's an allegory, but, and you just kind of have to go on it. You have to like, okay, um, yeah, this is the body and blood of Christ um, that I take of now. I mean, is this what he's thinking of? No, that, that doesn't seem to defeat, because he's doing this in um, response to ooh, Mr. P's point where, where he says, you yeah, know, the problem with religion is that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't admit that it's allegorical in nature. Sure, it makes people think it's true, yeah. uh, which if, you know, people, you know, if people realized that they were participating mm -hmm. in symbolic rituals that weren't, you know, actually, you know, they weren't actually ingesting the seeing the blood of Christ or whatnot, not, not, you know, if they realize this is all kind of symbolic ritual, well, well it would not be da damaging. It was, uh, you know, P's point there. And then D brings up, he talks about his mysteries in response to that, which makes it think like he's trying to say, that, yeah, because it has these mysteries, you know, it's, it's, it's telling you right here, it's, it's not true. So, you know, it seems to be what, like, just... Yeah, why would he do from, that? Yeah, from, this, from the steps of the argument, that seems like it'd be what he's trying to accomplish. But I don't see how this argument on mysteries accomplishes what he's trying to accomplish. Mm. What I... Okay. What I think he's trying to accomplish. Which, mm. Yeah, I... I don't know what to say about that either. Because um, it seems like... Do you think is the point here that, like, religion... He's saying something more along the lines of, no, religion doesn't say it has the truth, per se. It just says it has things beyond which you can't ask. Mm. Right? You can't ask any further beyond, like... That's why he calls it a terminus technicus, right? Right? In other words, it's a terminus. Like, questions end here. God did it. Questions can't go any further than that. Making it a mystery, right? I suppose some of these mysteries would be like, too, like what that God is three things and then one thing at the same time, or or what does it say? Pascal said that God is everywhere center and, and these kind of things that on the face of it don't make sense. So you have to almost <laughs> pretend it's an allegory, but you can't. But yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe you're right about it. Yeah. It's simply a, a spot where questions, questioning ends. Mm, so, but this is giving it, this is giving significant an indication of its allegorical nature that for some reason these, these um, religious practitioners are aware of. Um, yeah. That it's admitting this allegorical. Mm, good question. It's, I don't know, like you get your standard redneck religious, you know, like, how should I say, literalist, Bible literalist, who, who reads every single word of the Bible as truth. I mean, it obviously hasn't communicated to these guys. Mm. But then you get your fancy-pantsy liberal uh, theological guy who takes the Bible as just a bunch of stories that are supposed to make us see, like, some kind of moral truth. It's, apparently it's been communicated to this guy. I, I don't know, yeah, I don't know how, how D's answer to this might can make the connection. Mm. I mean, isn't, I mean, doesn't religion at a certain level have to be taken? I mean, even religious people take certain levels of religion as an allegory. I mean, mm. I mean, Schopenhauer here even points out the fact that the rationalists and the supernaturalists are absurd because they both think it's literally true. Mm. I mean, do, do does everybody, especially back then, did everyone really believe in the literal to truth of everything? I mean, surely they took some things as an allegory for others. Hmm. I'm sure the Greeks didn't literally think everything that happened in their stories were true. Um, I don't think the early fathers of the church did either. Hmm. Mm. Hmm. Well, yes, that makes. Per uh, uh, I just can't. I can't see how he's. 
what the step here is in the argument. Yeah, what, step, what step in the move? What the step in this debate is? It almost seems like this was um like he was buying time for his next argument or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, like if if they did, because the point is that if they saw it as an allegory, then they would give it up in favor of just the literal truth, right? Why would you need the allegory if mm. you just could handle the truth anyway, right? Mm-hmm. He kind of rela- he kind of lumps both myth into allegory here. He says, "Yeah, they kind of myth and allegory are what man needs for his metaphysical craving." And then, because P's response is to this is kind of like, "Yeah, like a wooden leg takes the place of a natural one when you lose it." So I must have something to do with like the crazy. You must be talking about the myths used, the, the seemingly. False on the face of them myths that religion uses to get people to believe something. Mm, yeah, because so I guess maybe this might be people don't think that they that kill it, you know murder is wrong um, because they found the philosophical truth that tells you it's wrong. They think it's wrong because Moses ha- was bestowed a stone tablet that said it was wrong. Yeah. It's probably or, or, or is more or less where the, the terminus is, right? That's where mm. it, they stop questioning anyway. Mm. I, I guess. I do like the point like you brought up though, Dustin, about where he says like both these kind of super atheistic people and these super religious people both come off as looking crazy and absurd because they both take it as literally true. Literally true. I mean, this is like something that's come up again and again and again with some of these less lesser skilled new atheists who like insist on reading every single word in the Bible as literally true and then they're always getting met with this. Well, you know, it's not really literally true. You're attacking, you're attacking a redneck guy out in the woods who never talked to anyone in his life, right? I mean, it's, is that who you really want to attack here, right? And then it goes back and forth and back and forth like that, but... I thought it was a very, very timely observation. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I like where he goes next with this, too. I mean, because we're going to have to talk about man Man is a metaphysical animal. I mean, that's one of his... That's one of... D, is it D's point? Yeah. Man is a man is a metaphysical animal. Mm, we need our metaphysics. Um, that he needs us a point where. Uh, what does he say? Because the horizon of his thoughts must come to an end. Right? The horizon of our thoughts have to go come to an end somewhere. We have to have. But what what is I don't know, I like this a lot. This is one of the most interesting points in this, and Schopenhauer has a whole essay about this. Right, man is a metaphysical animal. Yeah. Um, I guess the first question is, is that true? Oh, well, when you use metaphysical, or, or it, you know, the word metaphysical has some very strong connotations chins, chins that lead in certain directions. But I, you know, Let we me, do have to make... What? Oh, before, we, before, before we come in here, I'll read his definition for you. Okay. Just so, so we know what we're talking about. It, I in the essay where he talks about this. This is his definition. By metaphysics, I understand the so-called knowledge that goes beyond the possibility of existence. So-called, and, and so beyond nature or, or the given phenomen, phenomenal appearance of things. In order to give information about that by which, in some sense or other, this experience or nature is conditioned. Or in the popular, popular language, that, about that which is hidden behind nature and renders nature possible. In other words, the foundation of the world. Right? What, 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 what makes this world possible is some other world beyond it. This is what, what he means by metaphysics here. Well, perhaps, perhaps because, you know, human beings, we have a, a tendency to want to explain things, things to find, get behind things, things that this is one of the reasons we've been able to advance our technology so far. There, are, but there, you know, you hit a, you hit a wall somewhere. There, 
there's only so far you can you can explain with your own um, in empirical uh, experiences here. That's that's redundant, but anyway, ways. Okay, so you know that that leap of faith has to be made somewhere, where, where in order to keep explaining things, you know, to kind of explain things to their end as as we want to do. Um, I guess probably, you know, religion is that that leap of faith, and, and maybe even if we look at it, you know, philosophers, whereas they're working completely on this level of uh, things we can see. The, you know, there are people who have just resisted or, you know, making that leap of faith you know, to find that end. There are people who can never, because, I don't know, it seems fair to say, at least based on our, our current technologies, we're never going to be able to explain everything to its end. And, and so either we kind of, you know, scramble around on this, on this plane trying to, to explain things as best we can, or we make a leap of faith. It seems like this is the two options we're pre pre presented with at this moment. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with the fact that man, people inqui are very inquisitive and they want to know why something happened. I mean, there's they mm. want to know the cause of something else. Like something mm. happened, and they you immediately look around for a cause, right? Like mm. Khan, like Khan said, right? You see something happen, you immediately try to guess why did that happen. Um, but maybe the metaphysical need is maybe the metaphysical animal, the metaphysical need is, is a little bit further than that. I mean, I guess I guess my 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 counterexample would be the Greeks or the Japanese um, or the Jews in a certain sense. Um, they the 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 early Greeks before Plato, they didn't have an idea that there was a world beyond this world supporting it. Um, the Japanese, the early Japanese had Shinto, and there was no, there might have been a heaven, right, in a world you go and you die, but it was probably to them a very real place, a very physical place, and it wasn't a beyond that supported this world and made this world kind of an illusion. That came in with Buddhism, right? So, mm -hmm. or, or the Jews, right, they didn't have a uh, heaven or anything like that. All they had was just this world here, right, and then heaven and hell. But was there was there a world beyond? They really had no idea of the afterlife, right? Christianity came in and gave us this kind of matrix world where there's one world behind our world that supports it and props it up, and that we have to get to know that. It's, isn't that? I mean, it seems like early man didn't have a metaphysical understanding of the world. Hmm. <sighs> Um, what would you think if I said like, and like your arguments with the, with the Greeks and all? What about just the mere existence of Mister P? He doesn't how seem do you, to. How do you mean? He doesn't seem to need one. No, man. I mean, how could P exist without one? I mean, that's why I, I kind of like D's wording. He says something along the lines of. Man is an animal metaphysical. In other words, he has a predominantly strong metaphysical need. Yeah. He doesn't say it must happen, but he says it's really, mm. really strong. Um, so we need these dogmas. But it almost seems like in the page before, on 343, he says, because P here, he says to him, like, what is the use uh, of grounds of consolation and tranquility which are constantly overshadowed by the Damocles sword of disillusion, of religion? Truth, my friend, is the only sound thing. It alone remains steadfast and staunch. Its consolation alone is solid. It is the or indestructible diamond. And then Demophiles here, he says, Yes, if you had truth in your pocket, ready to bless us uh, with it on demand, but what you have are only metaphysical systems where nothing is certain except the headaches they cost. Before we take something away from a man, we must give have something better to put in its place. Um, so, it's kind of D here is his point more something along the lines of um, me, philosophical systems lack certainty, and man demands certainty. Um, whereas, it would be an even more objectionable point. I mean, along the lines like D seems to believe man needs certainty, mm. and P 
I don't know. The very existence of P seems to show maybe he doesn't. Because uh, it's isn't that his complaint against these philosophical systems? They're uncertain. That's why they can't be effective. Like that's mm -hmm. why they can't motivate the stupid masses, right? Because like there's always room to doubt them. They're difficult. Right? Yeah. But I don't think like. Do you think people need certainty? I don't think so. I think some people need certainty. Yeah, true. Good points. Good points. I think we need a certain degree of certainty. You Certainly. Need... <laughs> you... <laughs> I mean, imagine living every day, day not knowing whether I'm getting get a paycheck or not. <laughs> well, <laughs> hmm. Well, <laughs> there are certain people who do this. This. Mm. Yes, there are certain people who do this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, we all. I think the level is always there, but we need something, something to anchor ourselves on. Um, mm. You know, maybe the foundation that we need to anchor ourselves on. You know, how deep it has to be is varies from person to person, but if you don't have something to anchor yourself on, you kind of lose sight of yourself. Well, what if I change it a little bit? Because I like what I agree with you, but what if I change it to, to, to this? He seems to think people need absolute certainty. Mm. Like, whereas, like, you could have, like, levels of certainty without having absolute certainty. What if well, I talked about absolute certainty? Okay, well, absolute certainty, I think, is objectionable, because there's because the whole uh, point of romantic relationships, ships, ships, all you know, this pursuing romantic relationships is about not having certainty. Mm. It almost seems like that's part of the game. These kind of these nampashi, these professional well, nampas, or is like is this kind of this uncertainty, this gambling aspect, like this thrill. It's all actually maybe probably more, more relatable for professional gamblers, even. Yeah. yeah. So yes, people do not require absolute certainty. In fact, they crave us. I would say they crave a certain degree of uncertainty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I. I. Maybe in love too. I mean, like part of the the spark of it, I'm sure, is the uncertainty of the other person's feelings. But what you desperately want, though, is the confirmation of their love, right? I mean, you, you, but you don't want this is this is this is Jean Paul Sartre, right? Yeah, but right. What what you want is them for them to freely say that they love you, right, without being coerced by you. But you want them to do that, right? And this is what you desperately want: the con the confirmation of their feelings for you without coercion. Mm. Their free their free admission of their love for you, right? This, this is what you want, right? Mm. Um, how about how about this too? I mean, like this. This is, I mean, like when we're talking about certainty. This is a very, very nice statement on certainty. Let's see if we can guess who said it. Uh, for that is how man is. An article of faith could be refuted to him a thousand times. As long as he needed it, he would still consider it true again and again, in accordance with that famous proof of strength, of which the Bible speaks. Metaphysics is still needed by some, but that but so is that demand for certainty that today discharges itself in scientific positivistic form among great masses. The demand that one wants by all means something to be firm. This is still the demand for foothold support, in short, the instinct of weakness. That, to be sure, does not create sundry religions, forms of metaphysics and convictions, but does preserve them. Now, that was Nietzsche, actually, in Book Five. Gay yeah. science, right? Yeah, we fearless ones. So he's Nietzsche saying that the weaker you are, the more the more you need certainty. So it, it would go. It's certainly in line with Mister D when he says, "Well, the 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 masses are stupid and weak, and they need they need religion for their instinct of security, of certainty." But mm. Nietzsche certainly suggests that it's a weakness, and I would definitely agree with him. Hmm. This this kind of where I took this. I don't I don't know what do you about this animal metaphysicum. Like 
it seemed to be that's where he was trying to bring this. No? Maybe this is a little bit of a digression from that? I'm not sure. What do you think? Is that what he means by an animal? Like, he needs some kind of, at least in the sphere of religion, he needs some kind of certain ending point where questions mm. stop. And it's just, okay, God did it. The end. I'm sure of it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess is it, I just find it interesting that, you know, early people, I mean, early people lived without the idea of that this world was an illusory world, right? Okay, they certainly lived that way, and they were able to live that way for a long time until Buddhism and Christianity came in and we became like the Matrix, right? Where we are not living in the real world, this is all an illusion, and it's supported by something we don't know what, a god or, I don't know, the nirvana. Right? But, but there was a long period in time in which we didn't have that at all, right? But now we do. And I have to say, we certainly, we still live in that time, right? We still live in that. I mean, the proof, the movie Matrix is the proof of it. Isn't it? I mean, the idea that that the Matrix is true is, or there's the, would it be exciting for us to, to find out that there's a Matrix, right? That our reality isn't real and that we're all living some kind of dream. That's the theme of so many different movies today. Mm. Um, it proves that we still kind of feel this way, don't we? It's pretty strong in us still yet. Mm. This isn't it. This isn't all there is. There's something underneath, underneath us. There's something. There's something. Some unknown world that, that's propping us up. Okay. But I mean, this is this is where this is Nietzsche's big, this is Nietzsche's big disagreement of against Schopenhauer here um, in the gay science. Mm -hmm. um, the metaphysical need is not the origin of religion, as Schopenhauer has it, but only a late offshoot of it. Mm. Um, so Nietzsche try, Nietzsche's basically suggesting that Christianity kind of taught us to live like that. Hmm. I mean, early men certainly didn't seem to need an illusory. Well, the Greeks certainly believed in gods, and they, they had they had allegory and stuff like that, but did the, the, the early Greeks or the early Japanese or the early man believe in it? The world was illusory, and there was another world underneath it, and that's very, very intense. Maybe it's not so. Maybe maybe what maybe the point here isn't so far as that. Maybe what you're saying is just that they just need a part where they can stop asking questions, right? Mm. Well, you think oh. what about pagan idolism? Oh. Uh, before you know the kind of the structured religions gens of modern day, there's always been. And people worshiping idols, those not in the way we do it today, okay? <laughs> right, but the, the, you know these traditions have been you know traced back. You know they can be traced is back to pretty much anywhere. Where where is this not kind of a form of trying to root yourself? You know, you know sink widen the the girth of your foundation that you sink your anchor into. You don't sink your anchor into foundations, that's pretty weird. But anyways, it's <laughs> <laughs> like, my is clear. <laughs> <laughs> Even if my metaphor is not. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, I... I mean, I, I kind of cheated a little bit this time, and I looked at Schopenhauer's comments on this himself in his other essay here on man's need for metaphysics. And it's interesting. Like, I mean, it looks like here Schopenhauer and Nietzsche have a little bit of a debate going on here, right? And this is where Nietzsche is going to try and score some points by ripping on Schopenhauer. But there's also something else that seems to be true to you. Nietzsche called the, the metaphysical need weakness, right? But Schopenhauer in his essay says... The lower a man is in an intellectual, the intellectual respect, the less puzzling and mysterious existence itself is to him. On the contrary, everything, how it is and that, that it is, seems to him a matter of course. Right? Mm. So and Schopenhauer wants to say the smarter you are, the more you begin to realize that this is a, this, the existence is a strange thing. Right? So this is, this, is, this is kind of interesting, Schopenhauer is saying, well, actually, no, it's the smart people that see that this is all just kind of a false 
existence, right? There's something there's something crazy and something strange going on here. I like this a lot. Didn't Kaufman suggest that about Hegel? That one of Hegel's he suggested one of Hegel's points about alienation was yeah. that he said uh, education was the root of alienation. So that like the more educated you are, the more you feel alienated from nature, the more you feel unnatural. Yeah. Well, even I mean education is even a form of alienation between people. Mm. <coughs> I mean, we've all experienced this. This, you know, you have little kids. It's Japanese kids. It's who they will treat us no differently until they're taught we're different. Mm. And, and you know, you, know, you can't really alienate something without being taught that it's different. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, how would you flesh out the difference between Schopenhauer and Nietzsche here, though? Because um, I want to keep both of them. I want to. I do want to say, like, education does seem to alienate you from the environment, but I do like Nietzsche's insight that, like, the demand for certainty is a kind of weakness, right? I mean, we could, couldn't we have them both? Yeah, I think we. I think we just, we could have them both. I mean, certainly. Primit primitive man was not educated at all. Perhaps it's just as Schopenhauer suggests that there was there was nothing in his empty mind besides the goings on of the daily life. And Christianity taught him to think mm, beyond he's, he's, his life. He's too busy lifting things. Yeah, exactly. He's lifting things or hunting block, things or slab, <laughs> <laughs> slab, slab block. <laughs> oh, wow, the Wittgenstein captured it perfectly. <laughs> But but maybe yeah I don't know it would really be nice to keep both of these that I guess I guess there's no reason that you're that, that even if you once you become educated about the mysteriousness of the world that it has to come to the conclusion that this world is an illusion or it has less value mm. than another world or there's no reason that you'd have to come to the conclusion that well this is just a worthless world and the real world is hiding somewhere else right. It doesn't seem like that would have to be your conclusion. Mm. I've heard, I forgot who said it, but uh, there's somebody who said the that religion and the birth of religion was in direct act relation to a increase in human suffering. Increase in human suffering. Yeah, um, it was because people were suffering the thing so much they needed some way to justify their suffering. Mm -hmm. And this caused them to latch on to religion. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I could definitely see that if you wanted to come up with a reason why you are suffering. Schopenhauer, actually, in his essay, he, he suggests here that religion comes through the encounter with death. Uh, mm -hmm. the further, when, you, when you seriously wonder, at the, when you come face to face with death, and you, you're astonished at life, and that it comes to an end, the need for metaphysics arises. Right. So Schopenhauer suggests that the encounter with death is what gives rise to the metaphysical need. Um, which is, I guess, suffering. I guess it could be thrown somewhere in there. right? Okay. Say, you know? I was reading a book about like um, early Shintoism by a Japanese philosopher, and he wanted to suggest that like, if you look at the Kojiki and all these early Japanese stories, that like early Shinto gods represented some kind of chaos that was always trying to impinge on and destroy life within the orderly group, right? And anyone who met with a Shinto god was cursed or died or their people around them died. And then like the god would disappear, right? After having brought chaos into the world. I mean, yeah, you could probably, if you want to fit Shinto into that, it might work. Hmm. Yeah. Can I can I ask? Well, okay, I want to I want to do one more variation on this, because um, recently I've been catching up on my extra credits videos on the YouTube's. The Myth of uh, the Gun. That was such a great video. video. It was a very good video. That was such a great video. Um, no, no, he did one. It kind of got him a lot of fire and heat about. Uh, he did one about faith and and video games or something science. He, I don't know why it was like a three parter too, but like, he kind of got himself into a bit of trouble because I think he didn't define his terms very well, if I'm going to sound all philosophical here. Uh, he's, he, he seemed to think 
something like this, at least when you watch his video, this must be his definition. It's like, um, faith, faith is belief without uh, absolute evidence. Um, so he said, he, his whole thing is about like, well, he says, faith isn't, faith isn't something bad. In fact, science starts with faith. Um, it has faith that things are the way they are, and then it builds from that faith on, to make things. Whereas he says, but on the other hand, religion tries to find faith. They're just like two, the same thing just flipped, right? You know, like religion tries to work toward faith, but science starts with faith and works outward because there's no way they can prove the foundations of what they're working on. You know what I mean? Like you can't even prove the table in front of you is real, really. So it all starts on faith. This was his... I hope I'm not mischaracterizing him too much, but it seemed the way it seemed to be the way he was going, and uh, it caused a bit of a firestorm, as if you can imagine. Mm. I think kind of strangely wrong. I mean, he but he had the, in his last video he had to reclarify and said like no 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 we just start with faith and then we can work out of it we can work out of our faith into facts or something. I don't know. It, like by building on what we learn after starting with faith. I guess. Um, but I think he, he might have been down with Mr. D's point here, by the way. If he read it in that way. Like, oh, no, no, you have to start with faith for everything. Everything mm -hmm. boils down to faith because you can't have absolute evidence for anything. I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I do think that's... I personally think that's wrong. Like, I don't think you need, uh, scientists don't need faith to start working on the properties of the table. I mean, why, why would you call it faith? I, I don't understand why you would call it faith. Is it faith that there's a faith? Do I have faith that there's a table in front of me? I don't think so. Actually, I mean, <laughs> mm, curiously enough, uh, yeah, well, there are legitimate philosophical reasons to doubt the existence of the table in front of you. Descartes gives you you some good examples of this. As these never would have arisen to anybody without having the ideas it is presented to them. True. So if anything, I mean, the introduction to faith almost seems unnatural. Well, mm. well, yeah, like it has to be introduced from outside. Like, you know, this, this table... Oh, I mean, this goes back to Dustin talking about primitive man, men not needing being faith, faith because they're just too busy with what's in front of them. Um, and you know, unless I start thinking about the possibility that I am just a brain in a vat and this table doesn't actually exist, I would never question its existence. Mm. I wonder, like, uh, yeah, I mean. Until some contrary point of view has come up, it wouldn't even occur to you to question it. Yeah. I, I guess. I guess. I don't know. What What if What if I came along? If I believed this extra credits guy's point of view, and I said like, oh, even even if that was what there was no other point of view, like the original one was just based on faith anyway, because you didn't. There was anything that doesn't have ab absolute evidence behind it is a kind of act of faith. Um. Mm. And like any action, like he seemed like he, you know, he, I don't know, he bordered on like almost suggesting like everything was really just an act of faith um, that you then have to work out of. What I would do then, I was, then maybe this is uh, me, because I can't think of a very good way to, to, to combat this. I might choose to run and say, <laughs> okay, if everything is an act of faith, it's because nothing can have exact, absolute certainty. I can't even be certain and that I exist, or at least I, as I see myself exist. Yes. Yes. Then, yes, every thing that goes on is, is an act of faith, in which case the word faith loses its value. Yeah. I would say it would be meaningless at that point. Um, mm. At the very least, you want to have degrees. If, if you're going to do it that much, I mean... If you're gonna make it such a broad word, at least put degrees in. For example, mm. yeah, yeah, I have uh, maybe I this my faith that there's a table in front of me, but that faith is like it basically 
you know, point zero 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 one, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not desperately trying with all my heart to believe that this table is here. What What if I could? Could I like sound all be all philosophical and pedantic a little bit, like in a bad way? What if I just said, like, well, maybe in a good way? Um, what if I just said he just didn't use the correct terms? Like he was confusing belief with faith and knowledge mm -hmm. with. Uh, I mean, he was he, he threw out the idea of knowledge. Right, so maybe I don't know for certain there's a table in front of me. I believe there's a table in front of me, but belief doesn't require absolute proof of any kind, does it? No. I mean, so I mean, he just forgot what believe was. I mean, believe in the broad term sense. No. Yeah. So you might say that his um, his misunderstanding it was a misunderstanding of grammar. I'm gonna get all Wittgenstein and say yes, this was a grammatical problem. Mm -hmm. now, he had his his. F of X is in the wrong place. Yes. The only thing that can stop a hardened criminal is a long sentence is a long sentence. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> um, but did you, like, speaking of Wittgenstein, by the way, I was kind of happy this came up. Didn't you think it was really kind of cool? On page 347, he's, Demophiles, he says something like, no, no, no. Instead of dissing and predicting the, the, the downfall of Christianity, you should be happy for what it's done. Mm. Um, it taught people to believe, to, to find out that the fundamental truth that life cannot be an end in itself, uh, but that the true purpose of our existence lies beyond it. Wow, that is such that's so Tractatus right there. Mm. Um, the value of the world can't lie within it. It must lie outside of it. I wonder if, like, Wittgenstein didn't read this essay a couple times. <laughs> I think that this kind of idea is kind of drenched in Schopenhauer's thought, too. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, what if to advance Mr. D's point, and what if I were to, because there are this t entire argument, and it seems like he's just desperately trying to, you know, he's on the defensive the whole time. He's trying to defeat beat the attacks Mr. P is putting on him. What if I were to s swap him to the offensive? Then say that actually maybe this inability to entrust yourselves with fate is actually a form of weakness. This the you know the this resistance and to religion is simply because you're not strong enough of to put your faith in something that you don't have absolute certainty in. Oh. I kind of I wonder would he would he would he admit that these religious guys don't have absolute certainty? I don't know. I, I guess I, if if we kind of just took take take that as just a proposition, like just for this argument. Hmm. Um, I guess I mean it would be kind of weird. I I guess I hope he would say something like this. Like, um, well, I hope that's the argument you use when you're working in Hitler's. You know, secret service, seek SS, and he says, you know, kill that Jew, and then you, you're like, well, wow, why should I? I don't know what's going on here. You're like, well, apparently you're just not strong enough to believe in Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have a little bit more faith. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I mean, I suppose I could use that for just about anything. Like, I could tell my wife to, you know, go, you know, pick up my room and, and, and make every single meal for me and, and then, then like pick up all my candy wrappers and she says why? Well I was like what are you so weak? You can't believe me on apps on like with no evidence. I don't know. I I think I hope he would I hope he would respond respond with something like that. Okay, cool, cool. Well then what about to then and um I get another possible move Move by Mr. P here. You say religion D gives people the power to act. Ah, uh, uh, this would be D. Okay. Okay. This is God. What, God, what was the name of our friend? And who? Fleming. What? Fleming. 
Fleming, yes. As Bruce Fleming. All I had was to be there. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, as you know, with uh well Schopenhauer's sitting up there in his armchair chair thinking and being distracted by whip cracking. He, those people cracking the whips are actually out there acting. I mean, that's what he really does suggest in here, actually. I yeah, mean, he, says, he does. Times. He says, like, I'm interested in the practical. You are interested in the theoretical. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, he all but goes out and says this hmm. several times. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's actually the, the, the kind of uh, the hidden truth in here. Too. I mean, th this, is, this is part of the point he brings up when he says religion justifies cruelty. Um, because religion does give you permission to act. I'm not, it's almost the opposite of what most of these theists like to think. But you know, without a god, you couldn't do you could do anything you wanted to. But if you have a god on your side, what what can't you do? I mean, what what wouldn't you be permitted to be able to do with a god acting on your side, giving you moral permission to do everything? Right? When he suggests in what page three fifty four, he says that. Duties added to God are withdrawn from men, right? So people begin to be lazy when they're when they're Christians and they think that praying is a good action, right? And then they leave the good action up to God, right? But praying is enough for them to be good people. Well at the same time, when, when you when you believe that you have God with you, right, you leave the moral and decision up to God. Right? He he he's got that covered. He can take care of all the doubts. Um mm. I can do whatever I want to now. So you kind of throw all those doubts off onto him, and don't worry, God will take care of that. Um, so the, the duty of your, if you want to call it a duty, the duty of you to question the morality of your own actions is thrown off into God, which allows you to do anything you want to, no matter how cruel or how evil. Well, actually, Mr. D, he does bring this up. He says, what was it, the guy? Hey, so long as you go to, to church and listen to the same... Aim, aim, reception for the thousandth time. So long as you do that every every week, you feel, you don't feel bad when you indulge in your in your little guilty pleasures throughout the rest of the week. Yeah. So definitely, it does give them permission to act, but permission to act incredibly cruelly too. Mm. Mm. What What if uh, just like because I I do I can't. It's difficult for me to escape D's like big core defense, which is just like, look, you know, the masses, as Plato said, the masses will never have truth. So what's the point of all this? It's never going to happen, man, right? Um, we might as well, you know, just get done what needs to get done, and people are smart enough to see through it. Well, they'll see through it. Don't worry about it. Um, he, 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 he waged one defense or one attack against that. But it wasn't a very effective one. The only one he made against it was the possibility of what we mentioned before of disillusion, right? Mm. That that by, if you lie to people all the time and then say, well, you know, they can't decide anything for themselves. First of all, that means that what is it that the 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 means the ends justify the means, so mm. that you can basically tell whatever you are you want to in order to get the people to do what you want them to do, mm. any anything you want them to do, and also that the fact that. It, it it's it prevents reformation of the church, right? <laughs> that, I mean, like, because the the indulgences certainly comforted people. So how could you reform that? And also, what, what grounds did you give to perform to to reform it? Because you'd have to say, well, it's comforting people, so that's fine. So there's no explanation necessary. Mm -hmm. right? And it, but he also then after that he said disillusion, right? I mean, what happens when people discover one of the lies, and then the whole system just crumbles down, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a very good defense, but this is the one defense he worked up was the possibility of disillusionment after the discovery that it, part of it is a lie, right? That's not the greatest defense, but that's the one he had. What, what, if, what, 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 do, you, what do you think D would say to this? What if I said to D in the conversation, if I said something like, well, okay, yeah, um, it's going to be maybe religions all the way down for the masses because they're just too stupid, but maybe some religions are better than others. Oh, wow, yeah. But he seems to suggest this, though, doesn't he? he and the, the end, when he, yes. know, he's talking about all these, what is it, uh, monotheistic religions. Mm. And she goes on his rant about how monotheistic religions, and 
cause all this, you know, this the crusades, the holy war wars, there's the torture. Whereas the, the polytheistic religions seem to get on just good. Mm. Maybe is the response would go something to that extent. Mm. <laughs> this this is actually what Schopenhauer thinks. I mean. This is where he starts to get funny. His, his essay is actually funnier in this part. His essay on the metaphysical needs of man. Because <laughs> he says, yeah, um, in the early ages of the present surface, there was, things were different. In other words, he suggests that the earliest religions are actually the better ones. that Because they get to a better core truth. And then, and then as, of course, the funny guy that he is, he also brings up, he's like, yeah, um, consider the Quran, for example. This wretched book was sufficient to start a world religion to satisfy the metaphysical need of countless millions for 1,200 years. <laughs> in this book, we find the saddest and poorest form of theism. Much may be lost in translation, but I have not been able to discover in it one single idea of value. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> it's like, he doesn't like the Quran, and he, but he praises to thy heavens Buddhism, right? When he says that, in other words, these are closer to the truth than the crappy Quran, I guess. That They've got nothing right. Um, so, like, I guess would would Schopen, would, would like P and Schopenhauer yell at me if I said, like, what? Let's just let's just take it hardcore and be like, let's just make a religion of for 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 the Joe Blows, a religion of numbers, like some kind of weird Pythagorean thing, like <laughs> you know, uh, like no gods. Really, in our sense of the word, just these numbers that exist and cause stuff and organize stuff. Um, well, how does this even work when when all, all of a sudden my child falls sick? Would I be like, "Damn you, five! <laughs> I'm again, five! <laughs> well, then, like, you could be comfort. You, this would be the prayer, right? Oh, oh, numbers! I hope I'm not too late. <laughs> right? Like you could add numbers in all of this stuff. Like this is the fourth time she's been sick. Oh four. Oh four do not abandon me in my time of need. And what well, would seven be the devil here? <laughs> well, seven, eight, nine. Uh. <laughs> so. I I think Schopenhauer would call your religion pretty crappy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he'd say that you said nothing about the illusion of the world or suffering or pain. What are numbers doing in this this world? Are they actually acting on each other? <laughs> no. What are no. they no. metaphors so for? <laughs> yeah, they only did so one thing. Right? They're acting on each other. <laughs> <laughs> only once did the numbers move. Yes, yeah, true. The one movement. <laughs> I guess uh, numbers allow for there to be more than one thing. <laughs> like, and plurality was made. Oh, wow, yes. you've covered so much of existence. Yes. <laughs> One suffering, two <laughs> sufferings, three sufferings. <laughs> it can be like the count. He can be like one of our priests. <laughs> and God said, let there, there be multiplication. <laughs> wow, uh, yeah. I guess... I guess, like, multiplication would be, like, the number of gods having sex with each other. And... <laughs> God, now, now we're getting to, like, Greek mythology, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, gods having sex with cows and giving birth to monsters? <clears throat> okay, how about, how about this? The, the value of a religion will depend on the greater or lesser content of truth which it has in itself under the veil of allegory. I think Schopenhauer's going to rate yours as pretty crappy. <laughs> <laughs> there are multiple things, and you can count them. Wow. Yes. <laughs> That's some amazing truths he's uncovered. Like, isn't that what life's all about, counting <laughs> things? Well, it really, it's very hard to refute the religious beliefs of this religion. Yes, <laughs> granted, yeah. <laughs> It is difficult. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of like every once in a while I get like people on, on the interwebs and on the on the onlines who are like deists, right? Like deists are just about in the same boat as my number religion, though. I mean, deism, God like stopped. He made the universe and he just like went off on holiday. Yeah, it's pretty useless. 
Yeah. But at least at least he made the universe. That's true. <laughs> what did one and two and one is just singing I am the loneliest number? What is it doing forever? Ah, uh, you see, uh one one is one is probably the most godly number. Because uh you need to have one of anything before you can count two of it. So it estab one establishes counting. Right. Plus <laughs> But uh, if you want to erase all numbers, you have to erase zero. Ah, yes. One, and one becomes two. And two becomes three, four, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine. Well, first, I guess this is what this the, the, our book of numbers would be like. First there was nothing, and then there was one. Right. Actually, did you know that there's a new theory of numbers out that says that the number zero isn't nothing. It's every number. Zero oh. is every number, and the possibility of every number. Mm. That's what zero really is. It's not a non-existence, but the possibility of every number inside of it. Mm. Which seems to make a uh, big boss's theory make sense. I forgot what big boss said about zero. I remember what Larouche uh, La said about zero. He was zero, but. You, you have, if you want to, if you want to erase everything, you have to erase zero. Ah, there we go. Yeah, that. See, because that's almost that's a possibility of every number. Oh, but anyway, that's just a, a weird theory in math that mm. I thought was really interesting. Yeah. That, that that that's why you can't divide by it's it's just a bizarre it's really bizarre theory. I have to look at this more. I don't know what to say about it other than it's an interesting theory I heard. Hmm. Um, but I don't think you're you're, th you're number three. It, I think maybe you could. Schopenhauer seems to suggest, or at least these people think that people are so stupid that if you taught them this religion, they'd believe it. Apparently, in their in their in their world, they think people are just that dumb. No. Um, and they might believe your number sex religion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> gotta have the sex. I don't got added to this religion. <laughs> Uh, you're the one that made number sex in there. Uh, <laughs> it's multiplication. But, but I don't think it really covers that much of what Schopenhauer would consider the secrets of existence. Uh, I guess, like, so he wouldn't, I, I don't know, if Mr. D, at least, very least, he would be something, he would be, <laughs> if I were going to be all like Mr. P and be like, screw that, we don't even need religion. Let's be free of religion. D would be just like, you know, that's not going to happen. Come on. Isn't that what he, remember he said that? He's like, yeah. he said, what was it, that your idea that everyone should become the founder of their own religion, religion yeah. goes against human nature. Nature, yeah. Isn't it kind of interesting? Isn't that exactly what Nietzsche told everyone to do? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> I mean, like, in other words, you know, Nietzsche is trying to be Mr. P here, and you say, well, you just... You go make your own, your own opinions about everything, and then when they come into conflict with each other, uh, they'll bump up and grind and, and make a better truth. Sex. <laughs> sex, and they'll grind and have sex, and then uh, the truth will come flying out of there somehow. <laughs> wow. And, uh, <laughs> it's almost like his theory of like perspectivism. When you get different perspectives on a thing, you know, you get a better view of it. And like when he said, you, everyone should just think their own thing, and then when these come into conflict... They'll, they'll kind of even out, and then his 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 disagreement with that is people can't do that because they're slavish, slavish kind of. They need. He doesn't say why exactly, but he seems to suggest that people need to believe in what everyone else is believing about yeah. the the origin of the universe. Or in other words, they don't have enough confidence yeah. in their own ability to see the truth or make the truth. Yes. Or, it's... It would be that those ideas are just so seductive. They're so easy to believe. You know, they they throw their ideas up against this wall, uh, this wall of you know Christianity, and it, you know Christianity has such a solid, but uh, concept going on here. Here, any other concepts just bounce off it. And so either you you don't engage, you choose to. Maintain your hey course and and there, or you get assimilated. Hmm. I mean, yeah, he says like you're right. I mean, he says he says a lot. This D guy he says a lasting community is only possible between people who share a fundamental 
fundamental metaphysical view. So everyone who doesn't share that, you're out. Mm. I guess, kind of thing. Mm. That's where he also says like the differences between nations are basically differences between religions. Yeah. yeah. Which is in it's interesting. Mm. Oh. Now it seems fairly believable. All countries that have similar, that have the same religion, tend to be more or less similar in culture. When we have our Christian, Western Christian culture, yes. Mm. I mean, a Asia as a as a tendency, Asia seems to have a Buddhist idea about the self, and that you should look inward in times of turmoil, right? Um, whereas we seem to have an outward seeking kind of lost object kind of I don't know archetype in us or something it's always searching out for the truth mm, trying to get back to Eden yeah it seems like Asia in, in, in a general tendency is komori gachi right they're gonna look inward whereas we tend to creep outwards like the Zerg or something I don't know I had to use bugs there. I don't know. I was thinking <laughs> Starship Troopers. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. I, I kind of want to. I want to like be like Mr. P and be all like, yeah. No, I have. I just. <laughs> I want to have faith that people can share different views and live together. Yeah. I don't know. I. I kind of want to believe that. I. I try to, but every time I encounter a group of more than ten people. It always fails. Uh, <laughs> well, but maybe maybe Nietzsche would say that the stronger a community is, the more it can do that. Or the stronger mm. a nation is, the more it can do that. And the weaker a nation is, the less it can do that. Mm. How about that? Mm. Which would then seem to imply that we in our group that can't maintain a membership of over three... Yeah. <laughs> is fairly, ...are fairly weak. Actually, no, no, no. Uh, we the members are weak. Yeah, the members, the members are, weak. are weak. Yeah, we are the strong. <laughs> they are the weak. <laughs> well, actually, we didn't push anyone out of our group, actually. So. Well, uh, yes, admittedly, yes. yes. No, I don't know yeah. what that really says about us, other than what it really says is that we 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 commune with a bunch of lazy people. Yeah, um, and <laughs> I guess, or, or we're boring. I don't know. Or we're boring. Yeah, that, <laughs> we're boring. That's probably the most. Well, remember how many views our last video got. <laughs> <laughs> the set of all numbers. <laughs> yes. well, well, see, that's better because that that doesn't mean we were judged boring. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to watch us before you could judge that. Well, yes, we're we're judged not even worthy of being judged boring. Yeah. 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 Not even up to zero yet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we gotta work up to boring. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, we're not even that boring yet. Okay, I feel at ease. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a second. I gotta get a, a drink for a second. Hang on one second. All right. Uh, busy, I imagine. Busy. Yeah. Something like that. Mm -hmm. it's, though it's more manageable than one might. Expect it's mainly it's a half an hour and three hours. No, oh. it's, it's mainly the routine is is of this half an hour, where that has you to like timed it all out and everything. Awesome. Um, well, no, it times itself out. It times. <laughs> uh, the, the timer goes off. Yeah. Oh. Um. Okay. Okay. Can I uh, bring up a topic? Topic away. All right. So, of course, I guess uh, we're pretty familiar with the new athe atheist movement, and one of the biggest problems they have is when people say that without religion, you could have no foundation for morality, and that's one of the things they covered yes. in this 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 yeah. in this book. But I, I don't know. I so, saw like you know a lot of you know uh, Matt Dillahunty and Christopher Hitchens, and they say, well. A lot of morality is kind of an innate sense of kinship with your fellow man, or it's an innate sense of fairness, or whatever theory they've got on hand. And it's, that's nice. And obviously, 
it's it's better when they bring up the fact that you know we don't follow all the rules in the Bible, so obviously we're not using the Bible to judge standards of morality. But I, I liked it when when he brought up superstition. Uh, that was interesting because you know a lot a lot of these people I think what they want to suggest is that you don't get your morality from the sub the substructure culture or the substructure books and in, in the Christianity per se. You you get it from like the hardcore you know you, you, where you live or you work and like there's something the, the base level parts of your existence. But superstition does influence people to do things, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't you don't. Ha People don't paint the number 13 on walls, or they won't do certain things. They won't walk under ladders, right? It's not simply just economic forces at work, right? So they want to suggest, like, for example, that the Muslim anger is all just because they're, they're simply in, impoverished and they have no chances and opportunity, whereas the hijackers were rich people with lots of opportunity, right? So, mm. I mean, this is, starts to suggest that... Uh, your mind does play a role. It might not be a huge role. I mean, a lot of it might be part of this ec economic situation that they're in, but people do operate on superstitious motives, so it is possible that religion could influence good actions. I mean, it's, it's not impossible, at the very least. And I, I, know, I just like this, they, they brought up superstition as a way that you're obviously motivated to do something that has nothing to do with your economic motives at the time or anything. It's, it's simply something that you learned culturally, and that's it. Right. Mm. Uh, in, in the same way, I mean, I suppose religion could, could be responsible for a few good things, like what Christopher Hitchens always seems to suggest, that it never, ever was, right? Or, or all the Muslims were doing was they're just enacting their, their economic poverty and their rage at... At the lack of opportunity. Okay, well, when the new atheists say, well, no, they actually believe what they say, uh, and, and they get yelled at for that, well, maybe they, you know, it is possible. I mean, it, I, I just think that, you know, it, it, it's not all just economic situations, too. The, these, these, cultural, these cultural effects really do influence people in, in some ways. In the very sense, you can't be totally eliminated. No. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um. Yeah, I. I mm, yeah. Uh, it I don't might know. not be I, strong, but it's, it's kind of. It's kind of. I always thought Hitchens' point, where he says religion poisons everything, is maybe he even said he. he I think he. The way I took it is he would even concede that like, religious beliefs may have caused an action. Uh, however, the motive he, for it wasn't. Well, what made it good wasn't the religion. Well, it wasn't the religion. Yeah. The what made it good was everything besides the religion. Yeah. That was like always his. It was always his moral stand that Hitchens was always all about. Right? Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have brought up the new atheists because they were the first ones to say the Muslims were acting from their own beliefs. Whereas yeah. previous to this, it was all yeah. swept under the rug because all the liberals would stand up and say, "No, it was all their economic." circumstances that drove them to do anything, right? Nothing in their mind was really functioning. It's all kind of this Marxist uh, this Marxist analysis of, of the forces of production and the situations they're living, economic circumstances they're living in, whereas they were the first ones to come out and say no. Um, ideas do matter, right? Yeah. So maybe it was unfair to bring them in. Hmm. Mm. Uh... That's why I like Mr. P, actually. <laughs> He's kind of... Uh, mm, Bobby, in a weird way. I kind of... Even though Mr. D might be the one who's all down with this, also. I, I, I don't know. Like, I guess Mr. The P guy, he would just say, like, hey, look at the terrorism. That was a product of religion. And D would say, well, look at all the good things. That was a product of religion, too. Mm. Like, uh, and we'd just be at the same crossroads. Um, they were both products of the beliefs. There was just one, you know, mass slaughter and one church built or hospital built. Um, I don't know. I always, I, I, I like Dillahunty's standard response, which is kind of just, okay, but do you care what's true or not? Mm. If you care what's true or not, then you got to come with me down the rabbit hole here. And, and no matter how many churches were put up, 
we got to find out if it's true. <laughs> or how many hospitals were made or whatever, you know. I mean, it's <clears throat> this is what Schopenhauer says is in his essay. It's kind of funny, actually. And it seems like he changed his mind a little bit on this point, but this is what he said. Um, Religions are necessary for the people and are an inestimable benefit to them. But if they attempt to oppose the progress of mankind in the knowledge of truth, then with the utmost possible indulgence and forbearance, they must be pushed on one side. And to require that a great mind, a Shakespeare or a Goethe, should make the dogmas of any religion is explicit conviction. It's like requiring a giant to put on the shoes of a dwarf. So. <laughs> awesome. So... <laughs> So yeah, he's kind of saying, yeah, religion is good for the people, but as soon as it gets in the way, eliminate it, right? Mm. Because right. It's, it's kind of like people. your favorite TV show then. Yeah. It's kind of like, well, you know, you could go ahead and watch The X-Files, but as soon as, you know, you start making laws against ghost busting and, you know, aliens, <laughs> like then we need to, you know, throw it all out of the way. I, I, it's fine. I suppose, yeah. I mean, if you get your jollies without doing anything from your religion, I mean, what the hell? I mean, it doesn't seem like Schopenhauer says that the religion is, is a great benefit to people here, whereas he kind of seems to be a little bit less sure of that in in the dialogue, right? Mm. He suggests, like, all the horrors of religion and the acts of terror and, and the Inquisition, whereas in this one he kind of just comes out and says, well, you know, it's, it's really a benefit to them. Seems like he got a little bit more cynical. <laughs> That's true. Mm. This was this was later. This was written later. Yeah, this is. You can tell by the grumpiness of his his his, his little mini quotes about the Jews too. So. <laughs> well, we read an interesting. Uh, just last week we read Russell. Uh, you talked about this. You know, man's desire for rivalry, or the. For competition, for fighting. I mean, and he did this completely without the context of religion. And, and it makes me curious. You know, they, they, uh, Mr. D, in the end, he goes on a very long, long mini page rant and about all the atrocities that have been and done in the name of religion. Mr. P. Mr. P. Yeah, sorry, Mr. P. You can't there, we at least give them letters that aren't so similar, but um, <laughs> um and also DP is makes me think of other things, but <laughs> Yeah, it's also my name. <laughs> yes. Yes. But um <clears throat> can these Is it not possible that such atrocities is, would have happened, or even to it happened to a greater scale without religion? And if this, you know, this kind of desire to compete and eat and fight that Russell seems to believe we have uh, exists, as <coughs> could not be seen that you know that maybe even religion was as though with the at least with the Crusades it seemed to be the religion was feeling that on and the Inquisition. Yes. yes. It could be that, that if anything in religion was just used, was twisted for that purpose, this, whereas, as, you know, as a, maybe as a counter argument to Dee's little rant here, here we, if we really wanted to kill people, we would have found other reasons. We don't need God. Um, yeah. No, I, def I think so. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can find a million reasons to kill someone. I, I mean, but of course, I don't know. It would never occur to you to stone someone to death for working on Sunday without religion, mind you. Mm. Uh, I mean, or, th those things probably wouldn't have happened. It's it just walking down the street like, wait a second, it's Sunday. <laughs> right? Like, I mean, it just wouldn't happen. Uh, but, 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 like, if, if, as we take those out, uh, I'd be like, well, I don't know. Those darn Muslims have got our stuff. We gotta go get them, guys. Well, okay. 
I mean, there could be a bit of nationalism and racism all mixed together in there, so... I, I don't think the Crusades would have happened without religion, though. I think that's one of those things that is just inseparable. Yeah. Like, like, the Crusades and the religion, they kind of go together, mm. just like the Inquisition. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, with, with, with Hitler, right, and, and killing the Jews, all, he just wanted an excuse to kill somebody, right? Yeah. And he, he, he literally used Christianity as an... He didn't even believe in it. He hated Christianity. And he used it as an excuse, a manipulating excuse to to get his revenge on Jews. Mm. What if I were to, to say, you know, with these... this stoning people on Sunday. Mm. Okay, these people who look at somebody and say... Somebody working on Sunday and say, Oh, God, I need to stone him to death because he's going... Because he's working on Sunday... Hey, without religion, Jen, let's say this person wouldn't have, have been walking down the street and just said, wow, that guy's whistling. Like, stab, stab, stab. Uh, uh, well, I don't know. I guess... <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting point, but I guess the, the, re, the, the hardcore thing is um, religious people do do that all of yes. the time. People do do go stab, 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 um, uh, even though they are religious. So there's not really anything magical going on here. I mean, the the I mean, you're right. Okay, maybe maybe this guy he was walking down the street and like he he if he had not been found by some pastor and educated in the wonderful ways of Christ, he he may have continued to be a low life criminal scum who is going to be you know have his arm cut off by Luke in a bar somewhere. But, like, <laughs> okay. Luke okay. Skywalker. Luke Skywalker, yeah. <laughs> Not Luke from the Bible. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> Luke Skywalker. So he would have been at Mos Eisley. He would have been the scum of the universe kind of thing. But, I, I, yeah, I guess it's possible, like, like he was walking the street and was like, well, I really want to stab that guy for no reason. But... God doesn't want me to, so okay. I okay. It, it is a logical possibility. <laughs> I mean, he. I'm. I'm assuming he also very well could have been walking down the street and said, "Huh, it's wrong to cause others unnecessary harm." So I guess I shouldn't do it. Uh, okay, I mean, sure that's possible too. <laughs> I don't know. Where does it get you? Mm. Well, that's that's not quite the point I was trying. As what I was trying to say is these people who. You know, who are using seeing religion as an excuse to kill? Well, even on the individual level. Well, well, you know, the guy who's who breaks into his Jewish neighbor's house and kills him and his wife. Like, without religion, would he not have killed somebody? It might have been somebody different. He didn't kill that. He wouldn't have killed the Jew, right? Yes, he would have killed a Jew. But really, his desire Maybe. was not to kill a Jew. It was to kill somebody. What if I were to say, hey, that was the motivation. Was not, the motivation was not religious. Yes. Religious was just kind of, it was the determined the target, perhaps. What, what, if I were to, what if I were to go the opposite way and it would say that it was because he had religion that he felt justified in killing Jews? Hmm. Maybe the whole thing was, what if I would say, would throw it all back and say the whole thing was caused by religion? Um, because he felt like he had God on his side, and with God anything is possible. Mm. <laughs> so Abraham can kill his own son, and I can go kill a Jew, because God's on my side, and I have justified wrath in killing him. Whereas mm. without religion, he might be like, well, I don't like that guy, but, you know, he's, you know, i got to put up with him, right? Mm. I mean, what, isn't the opposite entirely possible too, right? Yes. Well, well I agree God, that's, God. That's, the, that's the more rational, uh, the more logical explanation, I will admit. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to find some way to to salvage Mr. D here. Mm. here. Oh yes, no. Uh, oh, no Mr. It is D. very much more likely Lee, that God that religion Jin, would have resulted in that murder than present, prevented it. This is brought up many many times in the essay. Did Mr. D lose though? I think that Mr. D basically carried mm. the day because he said. Well, the people are too stupid for your fancy pants metaphysics. Um, they're lazy and dumb, and they need lies mixed with the truth to live, and there's nothing you can do about it. Look at how the world is, not how you want it to be, Mr. Th Mr. Pi Castle in the Sky guy. 
and he basically won, didn't he? I mean, he carried that point through, and mm. that was his main point. Um, and then, well, yeah, he, he kind of lost in the fact that religion, I mean, Mr. Philalides, he made religion look really bad with all the bad effects of it, but mm. he, he still carried the day with saying, well, people need something. He, his main point was people are metaphysical animals, and they need something to believe, so mm. give them something, and but don't, I guess the the only the only concession he could make was to, to Mr. P is like, well, yeah, when it gets in the way, we have to get rid of it, right? Mm. For the advancement of mankind. But for, other than that, the people can just believe any stupid crap they want to if it satisfies their needs. And did he win or lose? I mean, it doesn't seem like he entirely lost. Mm. Well, I don't know. It seemed like a. Well, of course, this is a pretty uh, condescending essay as it is. Yes, but both of them are. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I have some reservations about you know, suggesting that his entire point was based on the fact, because the people are stupid. Because he does seem, <laughs> if this was his entire point, it seems like he would, this um, essay would have been 20 pages shorter. <laughs> Because he, yeah. he goes on trying to, to justify the values of religion after he's made his point. You know, he, he does carry that point throughout the entire thing. Yeah. But if that point was the game breaker, he wouldn't have, have laid out his other points needs to be shot down as they were. Well, his <laughs> main... Yeah, isn't his point the, like, practicality? Like, in a weird way, this is the, the running thing through the whole thing. Like, well, okay, maybe some stuff was caused by religion. Maybe. He might have even conceded that. But he's like, well, okay, yeah, but people are stupid anyway, and we need something to get them to see the truth. Mm -hmm. right? So, okay, well, there are a few disasters here and there. But, you know, uh, what else is going to do the job? Nothing. This, this dialogue is about the value of religion, right? What, is, it, is it useful or not? And is it practical to use? I mean, it's not about the truth of religion, because both of them concede that it's not true, right mm. from the get-go, which just makes it kind of condescending. Mm. But the D's point is the people are so stupid they need it. Let's be practical. And what P is trying to do is to say the value of religion isn't what you think it is. And he, he gets so far, but he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't carry the day, does he? He doesn't mm. he doesn't he doesn't steam over D. He, he certainly he certainly makes religion look bad. Mm. But but D still kind of gets his point across that, or at least in this in this dialogue, that the religion is necessary in a practical way for people. You know, mm. he he might have lost a few points here and there. Mm, okay. okay, he didn't come out looking too bad. Mm. Although P had a lot to say, a lot of mean things to say. I mean, it seems like he's almost, almost, if that's the case, it almost seems like D is negating himself. His, um, his first statement, if we go back to page, page 324 here, he says, As between ourselves, my dear fellow, I do not like the way in which you occasionally show your philosophical ability by being sarcastic and even openly derisive about religion. Everyone's faith is to him sacred and should be to you. Oh. This seems to not be the, because if this is what we're, if that's the core, the backbone of his argument, it seems to nay that because he himself is being, being sarcastic and negative about religion, saying yeah, well, people are just stupid. That's what that's why religion's around. Uh, don't be, don't you be sarcastic about religion? Religion, the stupid people need their religion. <laughs> I guess what makes it so condescending is he. I don't think he is being. Sick. <laughs> he's just like he's just like yeah. Well, people are dumb, and we have to respect the beliefs that let him get through the day without being a sobbing mess. Mm. It's a kind of condescending view, but I think he at least D wholeheartedly believes it. Mm. Right? Uh, isn't it kind of similar to the situation where like, like somebody who just had a loved one die, and then like, you know, they kind of comfort themselves by saying, well, God has a plan. And then you, like, run up to that person and say, whoa, 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 whoa. There is no God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, maybe now is not the time. 
kind of thing is going on there. I don't know. Maybe this is D's point here. He's kind of like, like, look, look, look. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe there is no God. That's fine. But, you know, come on. You, you got to treat this these people with a little modicum of respect. Like the person who just had someone die on them. So we shouldn't be like those people in that Reddit video you, sh- you yes. showed a couple weeks ago. Yes. Remember, Dustin, you linked that one, right? Dustin is not moving. He froze. Everybody freeze. (laughs) Wow. It's weird. He's just frozen in time. I'll I'll ring him and see what's happening. All right. Uh, We're not going to do anything like this. Free to make a quote from Bad Batman movies. Chicka blam blam. All right, I can play now. I can play with it. Oh, he's gone. Oops, that was bad timing. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! That turned out much worse than I thought it would. Uh, <laughs> hey, you doing okay? You just dropped out. You crashed. Yeah, crashed. So did your computer crash or did you the did your browser? Mm. Okay. Because okay. yes, on these types of hangouts, outs, I cannot invite you. Yeah. Um, oh, so, let me check. I'm gonna check and see if Dusty can. Be oh, yeah, you're fine. Oh, right. oh, wow! He joined. Rock, thanks. But wow, somebody's gotten better at Google Plus. <laughs> oh, but you're probably muted. Yeah. Hey, you remembered. Dustin didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Say something, Dustin. Uh, hang on a second. Oh. Okay, oh. rock. Okay, yeah, I, my computer is really s- slow here. Well, I think that was kind of a divine punishment here. I think it's probably because you were playing with uh, one of the little apps, weren't you? No, I have no apps up. I have nothing up, and I still crashed. You were trying to you were trying to use Hangout Toolbox to make your face in the boobs. That always crashes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I almost wish that was true. <laughs> I, I actually did nothing and I crashed, which is what's even worse. Mm. It was God. Yeah, I think it was divine punishment. Yeah, so that, that was your God ten bots there. Ten bots. Ten bots. Um, I think a certain governor of Tokyo would agree. Ex governor of Tokyo. Ex governor of Tokyo. Now Thank God for that. head of, they got a, a pretty decent number of seats in the last election, didn't they? The Ishinokai, yeah, they did. Uh, yeah. Fifty-four, fifty-two, I think. Oh, that's that's not too shabby considering <laughs> the two heads are a little bit crazy. Yeah, they did pretty well. Except and they have Higashi go Kokubaru. Uh, that's that's also uh, that's a hindering factor, right? Like, uh, even though they stick him on TV every chance they can get, because he's the one that comes off the least troubling most times. Mm. I kind of I caused an interruption in our 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 discussion here. Um, I don't know, like. Uh, like the only the only other weird thing I wanted to bring up was there was two two more really interesting points. One was that he suggested that Christians considered non Christians as not human, which is why they were able to commit genocide. Mm. Um, that was interesting, and that certainly seems to be true uh, at least for a while. And um, last was he said that migration was a cause of the spread of Christianity. I was like, huh, interesting. Mm. It's kind of interesting that 
when, when that migration comment comes out, now, Mr. D comes up and he says, no, 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 no. Oh, when migration happened, Christianity was the bulwark against foreign barbarians. Mm. Yeah, it, it, uh, it softened them and made them moral. <laughs> yeah. They, 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 they both had their take on migration here. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. I was... Migration is one of the part of the spread of Christianity. Yeah, okay. I guess in the Roman Empire there were streets and roads everywhere, so migration mm. was made a little bit easier. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I liked uh, I, two images in here. I thought stood out so much were one comparing religion to the sword of Damocles, so that anything you do in real life, you kind of have to look up and see, is it okay, religion? Is it okay? Right? So you're constantly like looking up at the Sword of Damocles to make sure it doesn't fall on your head. Mm. It's an like, interesting metaphor for religion in, yeah. in a place that rules the country. Um, mm. A very telling metaphor, too. That was wonderful. How did Schopenhauer come up with these? And the glowworms. The glowworms. I'm sure we all noticed the glowworms. Yeah, the glowworms. Uh, that was a wonderful what. Religion, religion can only shine because there's darkness. <laughs> Ouch. Okay. Again, the most wonderful uh, images in the whole in the whole dialogue. I thought. Mm. Yeah, that I mean, especially that line reminded me of a painting by or a drawing by Goya, the famous Spanish painter. Goya, the guy that made the Saturn eating his child. That one, mm. one of his, his famous pictures is. A man asleep at his desk, tired, and then out of his head is coming monsters, these bats and, and like crazy demons and stuff. And on the desk below him is written, uh, the sleep of reason produces monsters. Right. Uh, Even back in the 16th century, or whenever Goya was alive, man, it, was, it, was, it was already a popular idea. It reminded me a lot of that. Mm -hmm. What do, what do you think, just on the whole, um, taking this entire dialogue as a whole, uh, what, what did you get out of it? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I kind of liked comparing myself against D and P, but I kind of found myself very much on P side. And in the end, I kind of was kind of, I don't know. D's point was very powerful about people being stupid, but I still, mm. I can't give up my interest in the truth. And even, it's difficult for me to give up wanting other people to accept it. Mm. <laughs> um, I, Despite D's point, I still kind of want to be like, you know, like, okay, yeah, but maybe we could have the, can't we try the number religion? We'll see how many riots happen. <laughs> Obviously, you, you you couldn't do that because then what would be the point of having a dialogue at all? Yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. right? What would be the point of communication or dialogue at all if you didn't believe that most people are capable of understanding? Yeah. It, it really is a it's a condescending paternalistic outlook, much like, for example, the outlook the Japanese government has on its own people. Hmm. I think there's a lot of view of that around here. I think. Everything is comes off as like a proclamation from on high. They, no, and re, the reasoning is never really fleshed out for so much stuff here. You just like walk somewhere, and then there's a big sign that says, you know, don't jump in the lake. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and there's another sign that says, don't be too loud. Oh, okay. Right, and then you just walk. I, it's weird. All this, It is like God is speaking through these signs everywhere here. You look around. Uh, with no explanation at all. Like, we've had increased incidents in the last three years of people jumping into the lake. Last year, five people were killed by lake by drowning in the lake. No, that's not written. It's kind of like, Mamori Macho, Watashitachi no Mizumi, or something like this, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Tobi Komuna. Yeah. It's like in this haiku, right? Like, God handed you a haiku. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
And they always make the stupid same poster for looking out for fires. He no Yojin. It's always some cute girl, and then they're like, "Be careful of fire, or watch the fire until it dies out." And I'm always wondering which fire they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the drug commercial. The drug which one? There's, there's the, all. It seems like we made this is just an excuse to get these posters hung places. It says, but all of these kind of uh, public service announcement posters always have cute girls. Nah. Uh, yes. And, and they're, it's amazing how they work their way into um, junior high schools, which seems to be an odd um, conflict of interest. But, you know, the, the, the drug one I liked. They grab the cute girls and say, Zit, tiny, dumb it. Ah, I've seen that one. And, and there's nothing to tell you what's going on until you, unless you read the utterly fine print that says... As you know, like Japan Council against drug use. It's like, oh, drugs are the zet time dummy. But you, I guess the first time you read it, you're kind of like, do you want to have sex? And then she says, <laughs> zet tiny dummy. <laughs> and, oh, and then, like, you look down because you're like, tear up, you're like, just like your whole life is falling apart. Oh, drugs. <laughs> 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 so, I, I, I liked, I really liked. Um, okay. In the in the station, there was one. It was uh, it had a it had a pig in the train station, and the pig said, uh, "Chikang wa tabu." <laughs> right, it was buta right backwards. Tabu is buta backwards, right? So the pig was saying, "Chikang wa tabu." <laughs> I was like, "Wow, okay." Uh, Which just BZW, do you want this conversation on air? <laughs> Well, what do you think? I, was, I think in general, I, I don't know, I don't have much more for Schopenhauer. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, it seems like this has been, this new atheism, I, I guess finally, it's the, we've got, there's been so much on the internet about the new atheism and the rise of the new atheism. Mm. All these arguments I've seen a thousand times, they're all over the place. Yeah. I just, I just really hate the fact that these people feel like they're so special <laughs> that, that this argument hasn't ha happened 100 years ago already, or even longer mm. than that, 150 years ago. All this, the same stuff happened. It took us this long to catch up to 150 years ago. And we're just redoing the same arguments again and again and again. Mm. It really, really irks me sometimes. I don't know what, found, what's new about the new yeah. atheism. I found, found that, you know, as Justin said, these arguments are kind of odd. Tripe, tripe, and even in myself, who almost every time I read Schopenhauer, I find myself discovering something new or changing or growing in some way. A, this dialogue, maybe he'll pick, maybe he'll pick up the ball uh, with the following sections, the essay sections. But this dialogue failed to change me. Oh. Hmm. I, it seemed like, okay, I can see this conversation happening. I can see where both of these are coming from. Um, yes, they're both very thorough. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the fact about people being stupid is, is <laughs> okay. That's, that's a very strong statement, but as Dustin's mentioned, and it would be pretty... It would take a very special person to go around life, you know, go through life believing this. And so you'd, you'd have to look at everyone around you and say, oh, yeah, you know, he's too stupid to relate to me. I mean, I'm just going to read my Schopenhauer here. Yeah. Yeah, this doesn't seem like a way I want to live my life. It seems like that's the way the media treats people, though. Yeah, it certainly does. Like, mm. it, like the fact that things on the TV can be like, is America ready for a black president? <laughs> this is a legitimate news story, by the way. Right. Isn't it weird? Mm. Uh, like, uh, this is America, American story, but I mean, you could take a million examples from every country, I guess. Mm. Um, it seems pretty common, this looking down on, on the masses, the great masses of people. I mean, perhaps the individuals, no, but on the great masses, it seems pretty... Mm. I, I, like, I, I guess you're right. I don't know how much to... This would change you, but I guess I don't know. I, I guess that's why he adds the thing at the end. I mean, it's a dialogue, and, and there really are no clear winners in a dialogue or really in a debate. Usually, and what he says is the the only thing that is going to happen is the after effect, right? Or well, 
I console myself with the thought that in controversies and mineral baths, the after effect is the only real one. So maybe this is one to chew on, uh, I guess. Uh, it's going to have to come to you later um, in your like darkest moments or in the bath or something. In the mineral bath, yes. Yeah. In the mineral bath, yeah. I guess it, just for me, it feels like I'm inundated with this discussion already. I mean, just constantly with our atheism, the atheist experience. Like mm. this is just this is inundated, and I, mean, I, it's, it, I guess maybe in Schopenhauer's time, this is you know really cutting edge stuff. I mean, he's saying stuff that feels modern to me now, right? It's just that, I don't know. We've been part of this discussion for so long, and I guess I want to give all credit to Schopenhauer and say he got a lot of great points here. Mm. But we've really seen a lot of these arguments, a lot, come up. I don't. I, I don't. I, I guess. And the other. Good, I think a really interesting part of this this page, this this essay might be that just the, the, the it really shines through that a religious viewpoint or the, the a, a, an attitude about the importance of religion comes with a very condescending attitude, and it really couldn't exist without that. I mean. Religion, or at least a belief in the importance of religion, comes with a condescension of people and the not believe and an in, in, inability to believe in their own powers, which is, I guess, the reason why we have religion in the first place. Mm. I remember watching Penn, you know, Penn and Teller from Penn from Penn and Teller. Um, he's kind of like a big atheist. Well, he's one of this new atheist group. He's one of the lesser ones, but. Uh, one time on TV, he said something like, "I want." I think it was one of those, you know, like idea think or what all these like channels on YouTube or like Big Think or TED Talks and one of these yeah, places. Big he big said, ideas, I think. Big, it was. Maybe it was big ideas. He said something like, "It's like you know, I get it. I get you, religious people. Um, if I saw a train barreling down at you, at some point, I would stop trying to convince you there's a train coming, and I would just push you out of the way." So he's like, so I get it. Um, in a weird way, I mean, isn't this where the, the condescension is coming from, though? You don't know what's best for you. I do. I can see the train. Yeah. Hmm. Of course, the religious people feel the opposite way, don't they? They feel like they're being condescended to by the atheists. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, uh, the, the exact point could be pointed right back at, by these same people, the other way. Um. Of course, it's interesting in that you know if this train example is you know the truth. For example, well, you know, I'm gonna st at one point I'm gonna stop trying to tell you the truth. I'm just gonna throw you into it. That this is the atheist point of view. The, the religious point of view seems to be yeah. At one point I'm gonna stop trying to convert you. And I'm just gonna let you rot in hell. Really. I think, no, I think, really, would you say, I, I would say, uh, I think Penn was trying to capture the real religious point of view, which is, at some point, I'm going to save you, because that's what my God commands me to. Hmm. And I'm not going to respect your will or your wishes. Uh, I'm going to keep you from going to hell. Okay. Because uh, that's the train, by the way, hell. Train okay. is the, uh, the train is hell. You're going to be going to hell. Um, so at some point, the blind need to be led by those who can see. Mm. Yeah, that's the exact. Okay, okay. Or right, yeah. I, I'd misinterpreted that then. I mean, yeah, it's very paternalistic and condescending, which is which is part of the reason why people, young people today, especially, can't handle it because <laughs> they're arrogant brats and they don't want to be told anything, much less what's good for them. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's a sign of strength, or maybe that's a sign of weakness. But it's certainly true. I guess the, the, the thing is, like, I mean, if somebody, some religious person would try to throw that right back at me, I would kind of be, I would try at least try to say, like, I, I'm not, what I'm doing is not commanding you to obey me. I'm commanding you to, I'm, I'm trying to get you to use your reason to figure it out for yourself. Mm. Uh, I'm not, these aren't on high, right? We're just trying to figure it out. So I mean, I don't. Know, I guess that's. I wouldn't compare it with religion in the sense that it's not a commandment on high. What I'm trying to do, mm. um, it's just the best we got. 
Mm. We're trying to use our reason to figure out the best we got. We don't got any more than that. Of course. No. This seems to be, maybe this is bringing us back to Fleming. I mean, but this seems to be one of the problems, you know, uh, why these conversations don't go so well. Because religious people, any, there's a tendency to feel as though uh, anything that condescends their belief is an attack. Mm. Because, you know, the, it's the unassailability of the idea that gives it it's it, that gives it its power. Where, mm. So it seems like you know we're yeah. You know, this is uh, I think actually I think Fleming said this himself. You know you're playing a different. You just both parties are playing different games. Yeah. I would agree with that. I think um, there's something different is going on here at the very least. There's some different stance toward the world going on here. I, I do often find, though, that religious people are very interested in just getting through the day. Mm. Um, they're like, well, God, help me get through the day. Or, or, I got through the day, therefore God exists, kind of thing. You mm. know, like, I prayed to God and he gave me strength. Uh, mm. That seems to be, like, a big, powerful core of what's going on here, no? Mm. Um, so, yeah, you're, I, I kind of did want to place this all in the realm of action, in the realm of will, in the realm of meaning. Um, I, 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 kind of, I kind of, in a weird way, although I think it's totally wrong, I kind of get where religious people come back and say, well, the atheist viewpoint is meaningless and nihilistic because, you know, it doesn't have, doesn't have a grounding for anything. It's just people... And we can't trust people. Mm. In a weird way, I get it. That's totally wrong, by the way. It's, it's all just mixed up and confused. But I, I mean, I guess it could, if you get like weird people representing like new atheism who are kind of like uh, every every third sentence is well, neuroscience has told us that people in this situation experience brain states A, B, and Z. I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> what does that get you? Doesn't get you much, mm. uh, but I like because these people are always after what's going to help me act, what's going to help me get through the day. And what, what neuroscience are, scientists are telling you about brain states A, B, and C are not going to help you get through the day. Mm. And what about uh, to assault to uh, maybe to push back these atheists? I would just try and use uh, Hashimoto's point. Made a akaraimi was it akaraimi akaraimi you know. Uh, is is uh, against these? Ah, yeah, I guess yes. maybe you might say something. Like this. It Sorry, your atheistic view—it doesn't give people the hope they need to look forward to a bright future. Mm. Okay. Right. Though again, this goes back to you. Know, you said a lot of just just people seem to be concerned primarily with getting through the day. Or it might—they might need that hope to get through the day, though. Yeah. I, but I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. In in this realm, I can't help but feel really aligned with Mr. P. Mm. Um, I wouldn't lie to people either. I I wouldn't lie to them to give them hope. <laughs> it seems wrong. <laughs> mm. uh, it's a false hope. I could tell you a million things. I could tell you Santa Claus is coming when you die to give you all the presents you ever wanted in your life. You can play with them for eternity. I mean, okay, yeah, sure. Well, um, in a weird way, I, I don't know. I, that would really, that would extremely belie my lack of respect for you. <laughs> I would really be condescending to you if I was just making crap up to help you get through the day. Oh, hold up. Yes, I am still there. Yeah, I had that too just like a minute ago. But, okay, what if we were to throw back at uh, Mr. D's point, which, which before we tr try and take these things away from people, well, we need a better, or we need a more complete option. That was a really, Interesting. I like that. I was really watching that point. I really because maybe yeah, I remember exactly the point uh, where P responds like, "Oh no 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 no! When you relieve someone of a lie, you don't take them something from them. You give something to them." 
mm. right? Which is a very interesting response. Um, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, you liberate them from a lie. <laughs> I, I, but I don't know. I, I, was, I just found this entire essay to be uh, really about how much do you care about the truth? Mm. Like, uh, what is the will to truth? <laughs> and and why do you why do you want the will to truth? Um, it seems like D was kind of like I I don't know if I made a cooler version of D I I think it would be somewhere along the lines of you know the truth doesn't matter. <laughs> I think he would say it doesn't matter. Uh, there's something that matters higher than knowing two plus two is four, <laughs> and that's you know a living a life not harming people. And uh, we got nothing else but religion to get us, get the, the large majority to do that. If I was going to make a, he's be like some weird utilitarian calculation guy who would be like, look, I'm just looking out for the greater good, man. Uh, you, on the other hand, don't care what terrible things happen uh, no, like when you reveal all these lies. You don't care if people get hurt or people get injured. I'm just trying to, you know, keep suffering to a minimum. I guess if I was trying to make a really cool version of Mr. D, he would just be like totally, he would, I guess maybe in a weird way, he'd be looking down on me even more. <laughs> I don't you think that's, I don't know. Uh, I, I can't, I can't, I can't get behind any of that, mind you. Mm. I, I'm really into the will to truth in this respect. I, I wonder, what would I say? Like he said, like if he it takes something from me, I expose... If for some reason I gave this guy these truths that his God wasn't real and, and it, it kind of abolished his belief in God, yeah, I guess there would be a short time when he would be like, well, what should I do? My entire foundation is meaningless. I, have, I can't continue. I can't act. I can't do anything. What, what's the point of it all? Um, but I don't know. I don't think it would continue forever. I don't think most of the time he was thinking about God half the time. He would just continue doing what he was doing. Mm. Unless he really, really, really needed that foundation. Otherwise, he would just commit suicide. I mean, I suppose he could have been that weak that like, by just making him see God wasn't real caused him to commit suicide. I, I guess he could have been that weak. Um, then I guess, yeah, um, that's it. I kind of, yeah, I did take something away from him. <laughs> took away the only support he had for continuing his life. <laughs> but I don't know. I, don't know. I still, I, I, I would tell him the truth. I wouldn't lie to him. I would be like, look, man, I don't think it's real. I think it's a lie. Because I guess I care about what's true. <laughs> I don't know. It, it, more, more so, it seems like, and I, this is a point I wanted to see even more in the dialogue. It seems like this is even a moral stand on my point, on my part. This is an ex extremely moral stand on my part. Like, can't we keep, try to care about the truth as much as possible? Mm. No, maybe. But I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Mr. D is a really interesting character for, yeah. for, that, for that being people being stupid point. That's why I like him. Mm. I just, although, you know what, to, to be perfectly honest, though, I don't walk around trying to deconvert people when I hear the Christians either, by the way. Uh, like when I'm at work and then some guy says like, oh, well, yeah, I went to church yesterday. I, I don't jump into the conversation and say like, well, that was a waste of time. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I kind of let him, I, I, I don't know what, the correct course of action should be, but if he asked me to my face if God was real, I would say no. I, I don't know, even, even, even if, like, I don't know, let's imagine he just lost his child and, like, he was looking at me and he said, Justin, oh my God, you gotta help me, man. Tell me God's real. I'd be like, I, I mean, I wouldn't attack him, by the way, but if he asked me, I wouldn't say yes. Mm. Uh, I would say, like, I don't believe it, but uh, you gotta do your own thing, man. You gotta find your own truth here. You gotta, you gotta venture toward the truth. I don't. Know, in that case, I would try to be as sensitive as possible, but I would definitely not say yes. So basically, you're saying you're nicer than Richard Dawkins. 
Yes. Yeah, we're going to Richard Dawkins. Kind of lost it after a while. Did you even see, like... I mean, of course, he started out kind of nutty, nutty, nutty anyway. But mm. uh, um, Did you see the point where he was, like... After he kind of ret- retired from his position, there was a point where he was like, I even think Harry Potter might not be good for children. Because, it, you know, all the witchcraft yes. in the Harry Potter... It was, it was a weird parody of the religious people he hated. You know what I mean? Like, we got to get rid of that Harry Potter. Going to make them <laughs> kids believe in that witchcraft. Like, oh, please, give me a break. Uh, not to mention these. He's not a very good debater, but he's a good popularizer of science, though. He's, he's great. He can, he can explain evolution very, very well. Hmm. Um, but I don't know. All, all of his, a lot of his philosophical points he's kind of buddied up with Daniel Dennett and tried to get as much as he could and then took ideas from the Enlightenment and mixed them all together and wrote a nice little book. Actually, I like The God Delusion. I enjoyed it. It was just a rehash of a lot of old ideas, mind you. And there are some weird points in it, but on the whole, okay. It's another book on atheism. Mm-hmm. No. It does seem like... Uh, this whole YouTube people religion and even on YouTube atheism, it does seem like the real wheel seems to need to be reinvented constantly. Though I don't know, like the same things do come back again and again, and I guess the question is, are they met with resistance or not? Sometimes no. Yeah, that's the big problem now, isn't it? There's no resistance anymore to the argument, so they have to go attack the feminists now. Yeah, that's where this is going, by the way. Yeah, this is this whole chaos in the whole sphere here. Mm. Uh, they need some nice religious targets to get, you know, reinvigorate them. Maybe they should... I don't know. I don't know where they need to go. William Lane Craig and all these guys. Oh, find them. William, William Lane Craig was never a YouTube guy anyway. He was a book guy, really. I mean, yeah. his, he debates online. I, you can see his debates online, but he really wasn't a YouTube presence, was he? Uh, yeah. But I, oh yeah, yeah, I don't know. Mm, yeah. I do think a lot of YouTube atheists come off as kind of having a slight case of autism. <coughs> <laughs> like they, they remind me of like some guy, autistic guy down the street. Like, you know, like they don't, they really do seem to miss, uh, like people, some people call into the atheist experience and say like weird, just weird stuff. Like I'm an atheist and I figured out why people believe in religion. It's because they get money. Because <laughs> they get money. The religious people get the money. And you're kind of like, huh? Right, wait, are you a human being? Or <laughs> <laughs> what world were you living in? Goodbye. I don't know. Uh, like, uh, come on, guys. Let's work on our psychology a little bit. <laughs> so you're saying it's not money? I'm saying it's not money. Oh. I'm saying that is not why religion was conceived. Some guy 2,000 years ago did not say, how do I get all that money? Right? <laughs> it's like a really er- early version of, you know, uh, the Scientology. Scientology. Yeah. L. Ron Hubbard, right? <coughs> how can I get all the coins from the Jews? <laughs> well. <laughs> why would he start with the Jews, first of all? Good question. <laughs> they didn't have much. The Romans had the coins. Yeah. They made the coins. So, I guess, in a weird way, maybe we should accept that. Like, it was all about getting the money because then we could just make Mario the new religion. Because he's all about getting coins. <laughs> I saw Mario was like a Jesus figure. Oh. And he was destroying the, you know, the inhabitants of the Mushroom Kingdom to do it. Yes, and... yes. Anyone gets in his way, just make them break apart and take the money out of him. <laughs> So Koopa's like Satan, and he's, he's it's such what's all fire down there, and Princess yeah. Peach is in hell. Yeah, it's like a Greek myth almost. He has to get Persephone back from hell or whatever, <laughs> and she can only stay like for six months, and then she's taken back by Koopa into hell again. That's why there's Mario one and two and three and four. Right, and she goes, she travels between. It's actually it's just an internal <laughs> cycle, right? We haven't realized that, but yeah, yeah it's like a yin and a yang, yeah. constantly battling. But what? The- <laughs> 
it almost like that in, the, in real life, you know, because one, you know, every four years or every, I guess maybe every system, um, um, Koopa, he kidnaps Princess Peach, Peach, then Mario saves him, and then he's, and you get the, the season of, you know, the spring with Princess Peach is back and Mario's busy playing tennis and driving carts. And then the yeah, next system yeah. comes out, and Koopa again and kidnaps uh, Peach, and he, he has to rescue Princess Peach again before he can go back to playing tennis. Yeah, it was, Wait, it was a great mesh. What does Peach represent then, though? <coughs> oh well, if we go with the um, Japanese myth- mythological symbol, your know, Peach is just represented vaginas. I like that. <laughs> oh, really? Wait, really? I didn't know Peach Momo. Really? Oh, it's mm. there's a lot Momo, of you know. In the culture, uh, there's a lot of imagery uh, around peaches. Mm. Well, yeah. they have that nice shape. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're pink. All the good ones are pink. And then you split them open in a red butter. <laughs> it's but, a uh, cyclic thing, yeah. Uh, it's like, again, I will, I will ask again, do we want this to be on air? Are we done with Schopenhauer? Are we done with Schopenhauer? I got no more comments on, on religion. <laughs> <laughs> I guess... I guess my last question that we can stop is, is the will to truth strength or weakness, or can it be both? Mm. Uh, Perhaps ups- it depends on its motivations. Mm. I guess, is it the will to truth we're talking about, or the will to certainty we're talking about? Um, the will to truth. Like, you, in your case, you'd say you would never lie to somebody. Yeah. In any circumstances, okay. I guess I, I I have a tendency to consider that strength, right? Where in other words, you take you take on the destructive truth no matter what the cost. You're willing to put yourself in danger, even at the cost of your life. But I mean, what if that what if that attitude is suicidal, right? What what if that actually? I mean, I don't I don't think it is because I don't think truth is that interesting most of the time. <laughs> but but I mean, what what if what would you say if like for example, if I chose knowing the truth over my life, for example, I knew that I by knowing the truth I would die. I mean, it's just a certain fact. Like I don't know what it would be, but let's just pretend that it's something the very like that. truth itself would kill you. Yeah. Um, wow. And I, I chose that. I don't know what kind of dramatic truth this is, but I this chose is like that. the end of Watchmen or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, if I chose that over my life, I mean, would that say that I I I covered something? Other than life, mm. Mm. Well, mm. at least going back to this, the strength and weakness thing, and you know, you, Dustin, you said, um, kind of the wanting to toe the line of truth, no matter what the circumstances is. You want to see that strength, but just to play devil's advocate, what if I say that the inability, the to abandon in that line of truth to tell that 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 father who's just lost his child well that it's okay because God's you know they're they're in a better place now. What if I were to say that that's a sign of weakness because you're afraid that by even I man for a second and you know you've you've got your you're clutching that that truth like a beer can here. Here, and you're afraid that even if for a second you put that beer can down, um, when you go to pick it up again, it won't be there. It, it'll somehow slip through your fingers. There's, what if I were to take the, the devil's advocate and say that? Mm, 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 mm. Hmm. Well, I don't know. I guess in my motivations in that sense of telling the man that his, his daughter had gone to oblivion, I guess I guess my motivation in that would be not to lie to somebody or not to lie to myself, not to lie to other people or not to lie to myself, I guess. 
Um, I don't know. I, I guess I would... I don't know if I'd be so afraid of not being able to recover the truth again, as I guess it's part of my integrity. I guess I'd be afraid of... Maybe in a sense I'm afraid of my own integrity, and I would be afraid that I'd, I'd start slipping away from the truth, yeah? That I could... Maybe, maybe I'd be afraid that I would be slipping down into a comforting lie, right? And my first step would be compromising on, on telling someone the truth, I suppose. Mm. Um, but I guess I would view that as a comforting lie. And I guess, any, I, for some reason, I think of putting myself in danger or putting someone else in danger. I guess in this case, it's someone else. So I don't know how much, how brave this is because the example's kind of changed. Mm. I mean, if, if someone else were to come to me and ask me if their daughter was in heaven or not, I guess I might just tell them I don't know. Um, mm. I, I don't know if I tell them the truth or not. Um, if they had said more directly, do you believe she's yeah, in heaven? Then I would say no. Um, but if they said is she in heaven I'd say I don't know um, but if they asked me well, then I would have to say what I think um, why, why wouldn't I do that I don't know I wouldn't want to lie to myself it almost seems like though this uh, it depends on the content of the lie uh, like like there's that classic example people throw always throw back at Kant like, like, if a Nazi came to your house and you were hiding a Jew in the house and the Nazi said, do you have any Jews? And you're like, well, you know, it is immoral to lie. So the Jew in the, there's a Jew in the kitchen. I'm holding a Jew in the kitchen because it's really immoral to lie, even the Nazis. Um, that's something I definitely would not do. I wouldn't follow the categorical, categorical imperative there, nor would I even be tempted to follow the categorical imperative. Uh, there must be something about, like, I'm aiming at some sort of greater moral truth that the simple reporting of a location of a single person. So there, there has to be something to do with the content of what's going on here, like the importance of the lie. Um, I guess by saying falsely where a person is located, I really don't, <laughs> I don't have any of that related to like my sense of worth or my sense of who I am. So I don't know. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's possible that Weak people are we are, are are so weak that they can't lie, right? As Nietzsche even points out, like this is something he likes to point out every once in a while. Some people are so weak that they can't even lie. Uh, this is a, and this is a sign of their weakness because they're just too afraid of everyone. But mm, I, I have to wonder if, if this in this particular case, mm. I would say it wouldn't exactly be that. It would be more along the lines of you know, like I deem this too important to give up on. Right. I don't know if it would be a product of fear or okay. weakness. So, uh, where you can concede the truths and other other circumstances, you know, with your example with the with the um, giving sanctuary to Jews, is the right word. But uh, uh, where is? Wow. I even said there was Jews in the kitchen. I was trying to maybe it should be juice in the kitchen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> juice. But, uh, um, <laughs> So you have this level of truth, whereas the existence of God is a um, to acknowledge the existence of God as you say yourself, or the possibility of the existence of God, God and you feel to violate um, that's a truth you that you can't violate by. Why I'm not I'm not sure where I'm looking for, but you you understand? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, okay. yeah. Although although I didn't, I would definitely would not go that far. I would never, I wouldn't deny the possibility of this, the existence of God. Okay, that's wrong. I mean, that seems false. Okay, uh, like, oh, and uh, there's also that. there's also I mean there's definitely circumstances in which I would lie about that. I mean, if 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 someone was holding a gun to the child, uh, the father's head, and they said, if you don't tell him that his child is in heaven, I will kill him. Well, then I tell him that, right? Okay, I, I, That's I guess. A, that was actually one. I was going to throw out the example. What if, if in the crusade somebody came to your door and said, "said Are you a devout believer in Jehovah?" And they pointed their gladius to your neck. Yes, I and I say yes. I. Well, I, I which, which do you want me to believe? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say whatever you want. <laughs> yes. Okay. No. Uh, maybe. Is the right answer to be? Of course, I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then you are saved. Oh, maybe the right answer would just be, of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Choose. 
Choose the one you think no, I should believe in. Oh, no, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess. And that, in that sense, I wouldn't... If that sounds arrogant. I wouldn't, I wouldn't risk my own life. <laughs> okay. You would risk, I wouldn't risk my own life. If it's, if it's other people... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess maybe... Maybe in certain situations, I feel it'd be... It's better to tell the truth and deal with reality than it is a comforting lie. But if it were a life and death situation, I might be tempted to lie and live to fight another day. Mm. It seems, yeah, so extreme, right? I mean, the alternative is death, right? I mean, just <laughs> solid, confirmed death. So, in that case, yeah. I mean, I do like having hamburgers and steak, so. More than the truth? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, if a Christian should want to come to your door and say, say, I'm giving out steak to all believers of God. <laughs> that would, that would, definitely would not be enough. <laughs> that would not be enough. <laughs> well, that would be a pretty awesome believer. That would be a really awesome priest or missionary, I guess. <laughs> I was tempted for a minute, I'll admit. <laughs> <laughs> Free steak. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Maybe if I told him I might be a believer sometime in the future, is that good enough? <laughs> it's a possibility. <laughs> what were you saying? Well, let, let's judge on the, the flavor of that steak. <laughs> yeah. Like, is your steak good enough for you to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, it's a little dry. Ah! <laughs> there is no god. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, I guess in most circumstances I would tell the truth in praise. Mm. I'd like to tell the truth in face of blunt consequences, but facing <laughs> facing any kind of painful consequences, I would run away and tell a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm a coward. And that's what cowards do. <laughs> they say, which do you like, your left eye or the truth? I'd say, I like the left eye. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I know. I, I, I don't know. even know if I give up my little finger. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I guess we're li we live in a world where it's not really all that big a deal. I mean, it's not like by giving up your little finger, you're going to be the savior of millions. I mean, <laughs> they, they're going to walk off with your little finger and Richard Dawkins is still going to be on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, okay. <laughs> I suppose. So, of course, we are in it. If you want to uh, live a life without a little finger, we are in the country to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. Let's uh, make a wrong promise to the Yakuza. <laughs> can try that out. So I guess that was that was my last question about the truth. Sorry, that was my last question about the truth. So that's all I have about this essay. Unless you want to add anything else, Jesse? No. Ah, uh, my uh, no. I'll I'll save this one. I'm in for another day. Hey, I'm done. I'm done. All right. Take us off the air. Cool. Should we say something about how this is the end? And no. Yes, it's the end. And...